We're all set for a great day. And I just want to uh, start the morning off by welcoming you all again. I uh, see a lot of familiar faces. For those of you who are here at the Lionfish meeting yesterday, we had a great time. Uh, lots of ideas swirling in my head uh, last night about uh, new, new ways to cooperate and, and uh, make things happen. So uh, today we're gonna continue the fun with our artificial reef workshop. Uh, it, for some of you remember, two years ago, we had this same meeting in Crestview and on the evaluations, uh, we got a lot of feedback saying that you would like to have this meeting every two years. And so we had a group of Sea Grant agent, uh, Fish and Wildlife Commission uh, folks, and luckily we were supported by the Okaloosa County uh, TDC through the work of Alex Fogg here. They let us have this great facility to have it in. So that's how we all came together to make it happen. So. Uh, enjoy your day networking with everybody. I think this is a great chance for all of us to get together and catch up with each other. A little bit of housekeeping. Bathrooms are down in that very front lobby to uh, the left. I'll be at the registration desk. So if you have any questions, concerns, comments, uh, feel free to approach me and I can bring those back to the uh, uh, planning team. Um, yesterday, I thought one of the coolest things, in my opinion, about the room is that we had people from academia. We had educators in the room. And uh, then we had a great representation from the industry, charter captains. And uh, having uh, Parker Dustin here was a personal favorite for me because I, I got to see that whole process of from, you know, harvesting the fish to getting them into the market and everything. Uh, today, we are very fortunate that we have another uh, lifelong Dustin area resident. Uh, Commissioner Wines is going to give us a brief welcome. Uh, he has a fascinating history here. He's a third generation fisherman and was actually a charter captain for over 50 years. So if anybody has seen the changes here on the Emerald Coast in terms of uh, fishing and artificial reefs and lionfish invasions, uh, it's him. So I think we're fortunate to have him. Commissioner Wines, please welcome. Let's welcome Commissioner Wines. Thanks for the invite. I appreciate it. I, I uh, enjoyed the last one we did up in Crestview. And uh, I think a lot of good comes from these things because everybody gets a little more awareness about what's going on. Um, a little history. I was born in Pensacola because that's the closest place that did babies back in the day. And I had to tell you a little something about my age. Uh, but I grew up in the fishing business. My uncle had a had a, an old party boat. And uh all along when I was a kid, they wouldn't let me go, but uh, every other day in the summer when I was out of school, because they didn't want to burn me out. But little did they know that they couldn't because it was in my blood. But uh, I started uh, early and I saw right off the bat that it could be done better. And uh, I learned a lot. I learned more from my uncle about how not to do it than to do it, but some, some good and some bad. But uh, I really cut my teeth on the artificial reefs. I remember back in the 60s, late 60s, um, there was an old fisherman, a headboat fisherman, Benny Allen. He was known on the North Coast uh, as the best snapper fisherman around in the party boat sector. And the other one that was uh, a shallow water fisherman was Captain Ronald Gibson. He had the Gibson girl. And they caught more fish than most everybody else put together, it seemed like. But particularly Ronald Gibson. He started building reefs by off southwest Destin, south southwest in the, in the gullies. There's 18, 19, 20 fathom gullies. He'd take a load of uh, washing machines, kitchen sinks, hot water heaters, all that stuff, tie it together with wire. And sometimes it did sink, sometimes it didn't. It washed up on the beach. But when it stayed, uh, he'd wait a year, year and a half at the right time. He knew when those fish were leaving the beach. And he'd time it just right and he'd make some of the awfulest kills back in the day, you know, that you could imagine. I can remember one time Tommy Browning was bragging about his big catch. He had about 1,200 pounds in a day of snappers. And we're getting 28 cents a pound, so that was big money back then. And uh, Ronald came in the little after him at the fish house. I was at the next dock over from the fish house. And, and uh, Ronald had 1,400 pounds, never said a word. That's the kind of fisherman he was. He, he didn't like the big show. He just liked to make the money, you know. So I could see right off the future was in the artificial reefs for what I wanted to do, which was I did commercial and charter fishing, but mostly charter fishing. In fact, I missed out on the historical captain days where 
if you had a history of ever how many years back, you got a certain amount of quota. I had quit right before they started that. Otherwise, I'd been retired a lot earlier. <laughs> but those boys that uh, had that historical quota, some of them did real well. But at any rate, uh, it was uh, Captain Cecil Woodward was the man I worked for. And back in the day, he was El Supremo on the charter boat business. And so uh, I talked him into letting me borrow his boat one time. He didn't like the idea, but I, I put a, an old Ford station wagon on the back and I tired, tied about a hundred tires all around it. And I went down the, the West beach and a uh, little gully in about 65 feet of water. I throwed that thing overboard and I thought, well, maybe this will make a few snappers. So I didn't think much about it. The very next year, right before the Norther started blowing, I figured the fish would still be on the beach. I went down there and uh, I was looking on the back then we, we used more ranges than we did lower end. We, we had one line of position, but I used beach ranges because it was far more accurate. You could round up on that table if you knew how to look at the beach. So I was looking for this little place. I'm making a donut or two around it and looking at the fathometer and it was just streaked up. I thought, wow, there's a bunch of bait on this place. I wonder, what, I wonder if there's any snappers in it. Pretty soon I hear my brother, had both my brothers on the boat. They were hollering. One of them had thrown a Dixie cup over after he had drunk the water and the snappers were striking it on the surface in 65 feet. They weren't that big, three to five pounds, but there was lots of them. Caught about 600 pounds and went in. And that was the sort of the baptismal for me. I could see the light, see what I was going to do. So from then on, I made a regiment of, I, I put 30 wrecks out every year. Sometimes on a half a day trip, I'd get in. If the weather was pretty, I'd load up a, a car body or 200 tires or whatever I could get. And my deckhands hated it, but I'd say, come on, let's go. It's going to be good in the long run. And we'd go build another place. And we did that. I made 30 a year for 10 years and uh, before I slowed down a little bit. And then it paid off in rodeo fishing and regular uh, commercial fishing. And most of all, in charter fishermen, you could... You, uh, it was a good insurance policy. You knew what you were going to catch when you left the dock pretty much because back then there was very few people fishing that I, I, I concentrated more on the shallow water, more on the snappers. And down that West beach, I had lots of places and a few of them got found by Pensacola boats, but I found a few of theirs. So it all works out. But, uh, the artificial reef building, I see that all the programs still going on. They're putting bigger stuff than we ever put out and more of it. And I'm all for it because it, it gives a lot of people, a lot of recreation, a lot of places to dive and fish. And, and it's safer because most of the reefs they're building are within uh, fairly close proximity to the, to the passes. And uh, that's safer because a lot of times, uh, we used to have to run pretty good ways to get a mess fish. And uh, of course, in inclement weather, it's, it was tough. And back then, of course, we didn't have jetties on the passes like we do now. So it's good for those small boats to have something close to fish. Plus, it keeps them out of our commercial business a little, to some extent way down the, way down the road somewhere. So uh, the reef fishing, the uh, artificial reef building has been good to me and my family. And my son is a fourth generation fisherman, and he's, he's in the in the same vein, he's doing the same thing. Um, I was just looking over some of the uh, literature before uh, before I, uh, I knew I was gonna have to uh, speak here and uh, I'd like to commend, I saw where some of the divers, one of the lead diver this past year, caught a, a speared about 5,000 pounds or some ungodly number of lionfish. Uh, I commend all the divers for doing good work and, and uh, all the enemies of lionfish are helping us out because I see these pictures. I'm not a diver myself, but I see these pictures of these chicken coop reefs and uh, they're just like bees, you know, they're just the lionfish are everywhere. So I hope that makes them easily targetable and I hope they can continue to get them out of there. Uh, I'm told that the, and I'm certainly not in the scientific community, but I'm told that, that they've sort of reached a plateau on their, uh, numbers and they actually started to decline slightly so i hope the divers will continue and the more of these tournaments we can have and and i also have tasted them so i know they're good eating so that's all a good thing uh, i want to touch base on something that's a project that's near and dear to my heart uh, and that's the fad project uh, you know i kept watching uh when i was younger i'd, I'd watch uh 
some of these um, yacht boat boys had come back. They'd been to uh, Puerto Rico and, and some of these southern places. And I know they do it in, in Japan and in the Pacific, uh, building these fads. And they tell me that one lump somewhere down there off Puerto Rico, they put uh, use these palm leaves, palm fronds, and put a weight on it and just a piece of ski rope or something. And it won't last terribly long. Some of them, they say, last the season if the weather's good. But the blue marlin are just just ridiculous there around them so much. So I'm thinking back then, I'm thinking, you know, why couldn't we do something like that in the Gulf? Uh, and of course, everywhere I went, this is about seven years ago, I started this project and oh, the bureaucracy would be uh, completely prohibitive. You can't do that. You just sit down and forget that, you know. Well, I got with Jim Trefilio several years ago, and I even went to the congressman and the senator at the time, and they said, oh, yeah, we'll help you, but we didn't get much help from them, but it sounded good. So finally, when Jim got to looking around and talking to different people, and I talked to the head of the National Marine Fisheries at a St. Petersburg meeting one time, and he said, well, he said, I can't see any reason why you couldn't do it. Well, that really set me on fire. So I came back and Jim got to working on it. And now Alex is helping me with it. And uh, the board, uh, the county board got in on the action and there's a lot of support among the ranks for it. And what it'll do is it won't be as good as an oil rig down west, but it'll be something for uh, for the pelagics to get around. I think the dolphin will get around it when that loop current swings in here. I think the There'll be sailfish, I think, uh, medium-sized tunas. And uh, it'll be something, there'll be eight of them in a sort of a horseshoe shape uh, in the canyon area. And it'll be in striking distance of several Gulf ports. And uh, I think it'll be uh, something that'll, that'll be pretty good for us all. And uh, gives us a little uh, surety when we go fishing, uh, particularly the, the offshore sport fishing has somewhat diminished here back in the late sixties when we first found all those sailfish, it was just phenomenal, but, uh, it costs so much to go. And a lot of in tournaments, the boats run way down to those oil rigs. So I think this will be helpful and, uh, it ought to take a little bit of pressure off the, uh, reef fish and God knows they could stand a little less pressure on the snappers and the groupers and the amberjacks and all that. So it's a good project. And I want to thank Jim and Alex for, uh, doubling down and helping me get this thing going. Uh, Alex tells me that uh, we're going to let a contract very soon for the actual construction, so we're getting getting real close. It'll be good for private boats and and uh, sport fishing boats. So that's something I'm excited about. <clears throat> uh, you know, on these things, uh, on these type of get-togethers, I always like to have at least one fish story just to prove that I am a fisherman. Uh, <clears throat> in 81, I got GNS boats to build me a, uh, a sure enough sport fishing boat, called it the Sunrise. It was 47 feet long, but while it was getting be built, uh, I actually got it late in the year, but that Kobe season, I had a, uh, a wood boat built in Perdido Bay by Resmondo, pretty good boat, still fishing by the way. So that means it's a real good boat, but we, back then there was, Unlike today, there's more boats than there is Kobe's, but back then there were way more Kobe's than there were boats. And we loved that Kobe fish. And I had a bunch of those 302 Mitchell, that's old school Kobe fishing type reels. And uh, now they're obsolete. You can't find one anywhere. But I always took two deckhands in case we got in the proverbial wad of fish. So it was about 1130 in the morning and Kobe, uh, Kobe fishing primarily the best part of the day is when the sun's high in the sky and, and I guess they like to bask in that sun while they're moving to the west. But I was way down there uh, west of the west houses at Navarre Beach. And uh, we had one Kobe in the fish, little bare skinny Kobe. And I'm thinking, oh boy, I had six people back down there on the deck and they're looking up at me like, when are you gonna do some of that captain stuff? You know, that kind of thing. So uh, I look in there, they were small, but it was a pretty calm day, but a swell running. And I looked in there inside the gully and here's just, a, I thought that must be porpoises. That's, that's a big wad of something. I got to get a little closer and a little closer and a little closer and look in there and it was solid Kobe's, just a big school of Kobe right in on the beach. 
And I, here's small boats all around me. So I said, well, I'm going to get in there and get in them. So we got in there and started throwing in them and hooked three or four. And, and we just stayed. Every time a small boat had come up to us, I'd, even though we, I'd tell them slack the drag a little bit, I'd kick the boat up there where the small boat couldn't get to the fish. And uh, so uh, anyway, there was, it was a good bunch of fish. There was 19 of them in the school. And uh, this sounds like a fish story, but it's a true one. We caught 18 of them out of that school. And the, the last one that we caught was the biggest one. He weighed 102 pounds, biggest one. No, he weighed 111. We had four that day in the 90 pound class out of that same school. But the biggest one weighed 111. And we caught him on a Cisco kid lure about that long. You know, they had treble hooks all over them. Uh, kind of a prehistoric looking lure. But when the deckhand threw it out there, that fish wouldn't hit anything we had, live bait included. And it got sideways. It hung on the center hook and was coming through the water making a big splash. Well, that Kobe couldn't stand it. So he just came up and ate the whole thing. And, and we caught him and we knew it was time to go, but we shouldn't have caught 19 Kobe's that day. You know, I mean, now the limit is, I think six per boat. I don't even Kobe fish anymore. I took my tower off the boat because the coast guard initiated a, a regulation that, that, uh, Homeland security did it, but the weight factor was different and I couldn't take here. I got, I had a 53 footer and couldn't take but 12 people. Well, that's not conducive to making a living. So I took the tower off. Now I can take 24, I think, or my son can on his boat. So anyway, I got out of the Kobe fishing business, but we caught 19 that day. They were, they were following a big turtle, big old leatherback turtle. And he had a poly rope hung in his fins, a, a hawser type, like a tugboat uses about three inch yellow rope dangling back behind him about 20 feet. And so when we caught all the, almost all the Kobe's one escaped. And, uh, so the boys got a snatch hook and they snatched that, uh, yellow hawser, that rope. And I said, I told him, I said, back then we had Samson posts and Samson posts to tie to tugboat style. I said, just take a turn around that Samson post and let's see if we can, uh, cut that i thought we'd i didn't think we'd take take it away but we could cut that rope and free that turtle up well when we put a little pressure on him i bumped the boat in gear the turtle of course it turned him around and boom it came loose from him and he went right to the bottom like a rocket ship and last i saw him he was headed out across that uh brief that second sandbar so it worked out well for the turtle and real well for us so that's my best fish story of the day thanks all of you for coming and uh Appreciate your work with the lionfish and the artificial reefs and the fads. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. All right, so next we have Keith Milley with the FWC Artificial Reef Program. Um, yeah, I was like, how do I display it to the- All right, let me get, get here and I'll uh, get you going. As they pull that up, uh, I'll, uh, I'll just get started by, by also introducing Christine Kittle. I'm not sure if Maura had already this is Christine. introduced. Yeah. <laughs> Christine is with the Artificial Reef Program, works with me in Tallahassee. And, uh, and here's Scott Jackson, as you can see, uh, from, from Sea Grant, uh, diligently keeping our technology uh, up to speed. We're also broadcasting this for, via the uh, uh, Florida Sea Grant uh, Artificial Reef Web page and it's also being recorded as well, so you can go. You know, folks can be watching this right now, um, and also you can go back and look at it at any time in the future. Um, while they're pulling this up, 2018 has been a very busy year for the state of Florida's artificial reef deployment. We're continue to uh, build out the the NERDA artificial reef uh, funds um, projects, and uh, together with the partnerships with the counties, you know, I, I, 2018 has has been. Um, in my 18 years with the program, one of the, one of the busiest uh, to date. So again, I'm, my name is Keith Milley. I'm the administrator of, of Florida's Artificial Reef Program uh, in the Division of Marine Fisheries Management in Tallahassee. Uh, this is similar format to what we have had in past years. Each one of these slides probably, you know, warrants about 30 minute talk on its own. So I'm just gonna be really touching some of the highlights across the state, emphasizing some projects that those in this region might not otherwise be aware of, uh, and feel free to follow up with, with, with me or um, any of the other folks that I'll be recognizing during the course of this talk. 
Uh, first, I'd also like to uh, recognize some of our newest employees in the Artificial Reef Program. Uh, Jeff Renschen, who uh, has his master's degree from the uh, University of uh, the Virgin Islands and uh, was previously with the Research Institute of FWRI in, in, in Marathon Lab working on reef visual fish census and such. And he brings a lot of great experience to our program. Also, we have uh, Devin Resco over here who's uh, comes to us uh, um, by way of uh, Jacksonville University and the University of Guam. And uh, he is tasked with helping us administer and, and provide oversight on a lot of the NERDA artificial reef construction in, in this region. Uh, from the national perspective, we meet annually with the Gulf and Atlantic uh, States Marine Fishery Commission's Artificial Reef Committee. Uh, last year, we met about this time and uh, reviewed the, some of the new marine turtle considerations for artificial reef module design. We reviewed Alabama, Alabama's large ship RFP process. We talked a little bit about historic reviews for artificial reef permits. And uh, we started on the revisions for the guidelines of artificial reef materials. We're meeting again next week in Savannah, Georgia to continue our work on, uh, on the guidelines revision. So we should be seeing that out at some point soon. Uh, additionally, on the national front, in 2017, together with Florida Sea Grant, we hosted a, a two-day symposium at the National American Fisheries Society Conference. This uh, com was comprised of 24 oral presentations, 11 posters. The themes were around the uh, uh, ecological processes. Then we kind of rolled into some of the resulting patterns and then concluded the symposium with some management implications uh, and some excellent discussion that resulted in uh, a symposium book that just came out uh, just last month, and that is available on the fisheries.org with American Fisheries Society. You can also view all the oral presentations online, uh, just like I mentioned through the Sea Grant Artificial Reef page. And if you are to look at one presentation on there, I would highly recommend visiting the 20 minute presentation by John Walter. That's him up in the top right corner. And uh, his talk was, was about uh, attraction and production in artificial reefs and red snapper in the Gulf of Mexico. And really, for the first time, you know, John um, brought in some of the stock assessment implications, some of the challenges in trying to modeling the changes that we're doing with habitat as it relates to some of the fisheries management. So to bring us back to Florida, uh, an update on our state artificial reef database. Just wanted to remind everyone, you know, sometimes there's a there's some discrepancy in describing what is a reef. And so, you know, you, you could start by thinking about the permit area as being the area is a box in which artificial reefs are authorized by the Army Corps of Engineers and Department of Environmental Protection to, to be deployed. Uh, looking more closely, then um, we have the patch reefs, and that could be a cluster of different material types. And, and each deployment might be a barge load or an individual uh, module or a ship or multiple ships. And for the purposes of our database, to, in publishing this coordinates out to the public, we look for patch reefs that must be at least 150 feet apart from its nearest neighbor. So with that, uh, during 2018, we have 187 new patch reefs reported across the state of Florida, 9,000 tons concrete, over 400, uh, 470 modules, four vessels, two barges, eight tons of, of metal, uh, steel spools, things like that and, uh, and 1,600 tons of rock, primarily limestone boulders. On the Atlantic coast, there were 33 patch reefs, and on the Gulf Coast, we had 154, mostly in this region associated with the, the mo concrete modules that were deployed with the uh, NERDA artificial reef funding. And during 2018, we have 38% concrete, 33% modules, and for the first time, modules is, is approaching and perhaps might soon exceed the percentage of of uh, concrete secondary use materials. Looking at funding, our funding for the Florida's artificial reef program started in 1980 with general revenue, then in 1987 with uh, Wallet Bro funds, sport fish restoration, federal funds, and Orange. We've been utilizing those funds regularly for the past 33 years. Uh, and you also see in 1992, the state of Florida started utilizing saltwater license monies, we use that as match to our federal funds. And occasionally we have additional special appropriations 
such as in yellow there, the appropriation for the Vandenberg deployment off of Key West. We had special appropriation of general revenue in 2015 in blue. And, and again, um, in 2016, we used general revenue instead of Marine MRCTF, but we are back now to steady at $600,000 annually for the state of Florida's artificial reef um, grant program. I do wanna point out the uh, 11.4 million that was appropriated to this region associated with the NERDA project in, in 2016. We're still working through spending that money down. I commend all the counties here and on, on helping you know get those projects built. Uh, so in regarding the, the NERDA projects, just I just have two quick slides on this due to time considerations. Um, uh, to date, we have since uh, September 2016, deployed 264 patch reefs. That's almost 2000 total modules. And uh, I'm pleased to report that some of the some of the funds, 665,000, were able to reappropriate those from monitoring that the trustees uh, did not want to use for monitoring. And we can now reappropriate those back into construction rather than going back to the, the pot or the, or, or the trustees. Those will be reappropriated during fiscal year 2019 and then 2020 based on our fiscal legislative budget cycles. Uh, and here's an overview of the project, the NERDA projects that have been complete to date. Mexico Beach was 100% complete, as is Walton. Uh, Santa Rosa County, Scambia County is 32% complete. Okaloosa is, uh, have the contract issued and is just about ready to get started. And uh, Bay County has phase one uh, issue. I think that contract is just about issued. So, so they're just getting underway as well. And you'll hear, be hearing more from each county on these projects as well. So looking at, uh, elsewhere across the state, I wanted to have one project here from 2017 off Hernando County. You know, it was 20 years since they had their last uh, deployment and they were um, ecstatic to see the progress um, and, and getting that project uh, deployed. So in the top right-hand corner was the observer boat with each one of these you know, 616 tons and 10 modules that, that hit the water. They, uh, there was a crowd, you know, clapping and cheering. Um, there was a shallow deployment. There were some concerns uh, uh, that they had to, you know, um, overcome in, uh, in, in that contracting process, but um, they um, were quite, quite happy to, to deploy again after 20 years. In 2018, uh, Brevard County deployed 24 uh, prefabricated modules. And uh, this was a contractor that's more familiar working out of the Miami area. He arrived with this large uh, uh, boom that made it very challenging for them to, to operate uh, you know, any bit of swell. You know, so so uh, it resulted in them really having to wait for the seas to calm down uh, to less than put, it would, what really could have been a half day job, kind of turned out to be a two day job. They utilized a, a surface supply diver to release some of the the modules on the seafloor. So that kind of implemented some other challenges. So I, I think it just, um, you know, um, helps us uh, point out that, you know, sometimes uh, the conditions are quite different when, when contractors are working in areas that they're not, not used to. Also in 2018, Martin County deployed two patch reefs, uh, 1500 tons of secondary use concrete. This is uh, an, in a second of, of, of two the Memorial Reef projects for Kerry Dillon, who was a contractor uh, and, and a technical diver in that area. Uh, and in 2018, um, Palm Beach County, oh, thank you, Devin, um, deployed 530 tons at a depth of 35 feet. This completes the, uh, they're calling it step reefs. These are located just outside the inlets in Palm Beach County. So out of each inlet, they have these artificial reefs and their intention is it's going to help some of the migration of fishes between that, that come inside the inlet and, and move offshore. The seas were quite rough, uh, four to five feet during deployment. However, the contractor, uh, double, triple, quadruple anchored, was had to stable, stabilize the barge and there are two nice patches of piles of material. Palm Beach County's also been working on trying to build up some, some deep water habitat for snowy grouper, uh, Warsaw grouper, red, red snapper. Their goal is to eventually put these down at a depth of 500 feet. Um, so they, they have had two projects already, first generation 
uh, in the second generation, these these are these are basically uh, concrete telephone telephone poles that are mounted on a on a concrete base. They are pushed off of the barge and uh, they uh, land upright on on the seafloor. So uh, in 20, uh, 2017, they deployed these at those purple dot locations and they felt like they were a little bit too far apart. So they, they wanted to go for a, a tighter cluster, um, which has resulted in those, those um, yellow dots, which is what you see in the photograph. You could see some of those were so close that I actually bumped into each other and there was some damage due to that. So they're, they're still, this is still uh, in development uh, at their third phase. They're going to move forward with uh, deploying in, uh, in deeper water. You can view a, a video at that website too for those folks who are watching online. Manatee County deployed 1,400 tons of limestone boulders. This is uh, continuing a series of patch reefs that they're, they're, they're deploying. I wanted to point this out because uh, they utilize their transom mounted hummingbird sonar to, after deployment, get a, a sonar, quick sonar map. And uh, later today, at the, end of, at the end of today's workshop, you'll be seeing a, a presentation by Travis Griggs, who will, will you know, for those interested, will help others uh, you know, be able to learn how to use those consumer grade uh, hardware and software to create those sort of mosaics. Duval County deployed 1,200 tons. These are uh, patch reefs that are centered about a quarter mile apart. This is a partnership between uh, Coastal uh, Conservation Association, CCA, was uh, really uh, stepped up in, in 2018 and funded quite a few offshore projects across Florida. So you'll see their name in a number of these other slides too. Volusia County deployed uh, the Tug Everglades and, and Lady Philomena. I'd say this is probably the most interesting deployment of uh, 2018 uh, in that both these vessels were deployed at the same time, right, uh, adjacent to each other. And then subsequently they followed up with with uh, with concrete deployments in between to create a, a dive trail. So uh, additionally, if you visit our FWC YouTube page, you can you can see a video of the of the Lady P being deployed. Uh, typically, we see these go down stern first, you know, listing to the side. But in this case, uh, it went it's went down perfectly level. Uh, everyone was quite excited. Of course, you could see flat sea conditions. And uh, the, the captains were taking bets on each other to which vessel would, would hit the bottom first. Turns out uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Lady P ended up um, going down first. And uh, 15 minutes later, the Tug Everglades touched down. Off Bay County, you'll be hearing a little more from Alan Golden later on uh, the, the vessel that Danny Grizzard and an old Navy, Navy vessel that was deployed at 92 feet. These were attached to some of the existing army tanks that were deployed in the early 90s and, uh, and was deployed to enhance the uh, dive attractions for the area. Bay County also deployed a 98-foot steel hopper barge. This was in conjunction with a, with a new association, the Bay County Artificial Reef Association. That's located at a depth of 148 feet. We also had a number of art form artificial reefs. This continues to expand in Florida. Uh, I have on there the, the card sharks and the Lady Luck. That was a project that was funded by a casino down there in the Fort Lauderdale area. Uh, in 2017, uh, the Andrew Red Harris Reef deployed a, a, a replica of the Jupiter Lighthouse. And in this area in 2018 is the Underwater Museum of Art that the South Walton Artificial Reef Association in Walton County deployed. You'll be hearing a little more on that a little bit later too. And uh, in 2018, the Neptune Memorial Reef in Miami deployed a phase two. These are, these are pilings just like that that are they're deployed uh, associated with memorial reefs that are, that are placed inside of it. And, and then finally, a future project that's probably one of the, one of the most interesting ones that's coming up. You could, you could visit their website. This is a, part, a project nonprofit called the 1000 Mermaids and in association with Miami Body Cast, they're literally taking body casts of, of models and making these mermaids that are gonna be deployed and with other artificial reef modules as a dive attraction off of the Fort Lauderdale area. Looking at future reef projects, uh, off of this area, are, there's a number of towers that many of you may have fished over the years. These have been decommissioned. And for the past five years or so, 
Uh, this has been uh, a line item for the Air Force to, to decommission them. There's been some preliminary uh, Coastal Zone Management Association review through the State Clearinghouse. F our agency uh, continues to recommend the reefing the structures, either toppling in place or relocating them to an artificial reef location. As of uh, just a couple of days ago, we heard back that they don't have any funding. They haven't yet completed the environmental assessment. So as soon as that, that comes back, I'll be sure to you know, route that around and make sure that um, our fishing and diving interests have the ability to comment in conjunction with the, the state clearinghouse process uh, for uh, the recommended disposal options that they, that they conclude. Other future projects, this will be the largest ship deployment uh, anticipated in, during 2019, anticipated to be deployed in June. 2019, this is the Bernadette. Uh, it's a 180 foot long coastal freighter. This was a partnership with uh, US Customs and the county. They're still in the fundraising phase. They're, they're auctioning off some items to, to help um, bring them to the, to the final, final stretch on that project. And Palm Beach County is, has been uh, working with the, you know, uh, the um, <clears throat> Artificial Reef International, Joe Weatherby and Bill Horn, who is here too on the USS Clamagore, which is a submarine at Patriots Point in Charleston. Uh, this uh, project is still in the fundraising phase. You can visit their website for, for more information and talk to Bill Horn uh, later today on, on more information on this too. Uh, if, if this is potential, this could potentially be deployed in 2019 if the funds become available, I think it will probably become one of the most interesting deployments in, in 2019. I wanted to touch on derelict vessel opportunities, especially you know following big storm events and such. You know, typically uh, when we have these derelict vessels that that were, were approached, you know, uh, in most cases like the ferro cement sailboat hull in Louisiana out of Taylor County, or the Shell Point barge in off Wakulla County in 2018, you know, they're 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 so far gone. They have a lot of holes, are rusted that they it's not safe for them to make the tow offshore, and they're usually not not able to be a candidate for reefing. The Navy tug in, of, off Volusia County in 2017, we were hoping would be a good reefing candidate, but as a World War II vintage, vintage vessel, it had high levels of PCBs, which made it cost prohibited. However, I was very surprised and pleased that in, in 2018, uh, just about a month ago, we got a call from our derelict vessel program, making us aware of the El Dorado 147 foot cruise liner. and. Uh, uh, this vessel, unlike the others, you know, was not only seaworthy, it was already clean, it didn't have any of those contaminants, really a good ready to go candidate. You'll be hearing more about this from uh, Alan Golden later. And as far as monitoring, we've been con busy conducting some post Hurricane Michael assessments. You'll be hearing more from Jeff Renchen on this, specifically on the Bell Shoals area. They, you know, that's what the side scan imagery there is on the, on the right hand side. But I also wanted in this presentation to touch on three other site sites, the Sherman Tug, the Shady Lady, and the Underwater Art Museum. So the Sherman Tug is an 80-foot steel tug that was deployed in 1996, depth of 80 feet. This was, as you saw from the uh, previous uh, image, that in, within the path of, of the hurricane. We had some side scan imagery from October 20, 2016. Uh, we revisited the site, uh, we resize scanned it in, in January 2019 and then subsequently dived it. We did not observe any hurricane damage, the no changes in orientation. And if you, if you see that, that uh, red area there, we were wondering if maybe that was kind of a scour hole from it, but it turns out it, it was uh, some silty sediment along the, the west side of the, of the vessel. Did not indicate that, uh, that there was any, any, any movement. The Shady Lady, on the other hand, was deployed in 2007, a depth of 90, 95 feet, land on its side. Here's a photo, I believe, from 2009 that, that I took, and uh, we had fantastic visibility, like almost 100 foot visibility. Um, and uh, uh, following the storm, we heard from Bob Cox that it was now upright, so we visited that. In fact, not, not only is it, is it upright, but um, uh, so the set, what happened basically is while it was on its side, there was a scour hole that formed beneath the keel. And like we've seen on other vessels, most famously the Spiegel Grove out of Key Largo, but the, the, over time currents you know, formed a scour hole. And then during a storm event, the swell kind of tips it upright 
into that scour hole. That's exactly what happened here. So it is the vessel is now upright. And in addition, that scour hole, it further expanded and exposed some tree stumps uh, around the perimeter of the, of the scour hole as well, which appear to be similar to some of uh, the Alabama's underwater forest. You can visit their web, website for more information on that too. And the Underwater Museum of Art deployed off of Grayton Beach. There were seven unique sculptures. We visited that following the storm because some of these materials were uh, lighter weight than, than typically we, we see on, on our, our, our other recreational reefs. Um, they were all in, in, in place with no movement. Um, however, the, the Grayton pineapple, the great pineapple was still attached to its base, but uh, this is, these are kind of thin stainless steel uh, stretches of, of metal and uh, they're tack welded together and you can see it kind of got somewhat flattened uh, during this storm. Monitoring, we continue monitoring with Okaloosa, with uh, Escambia County, uh, my apologies, on, on the uh, Ariskany artificial reef. This is deployed in 2006. We continue our tier one. It's taking much, much longer to catch the target fish. The species assemblage has changed over time due to time constraints. I, I have a poster outside. We can talk a little more about, about that poster if you want to look at some of the graphs and, um, and we could talk more there. We're still just last week received the 2017 data just to march our chagrin. It's taking over, over a year to get this data back, uh, but we continue sampling. So in conclusion, uh, so we'd like to just make everyone aware of some dates to, to keep in mind. Our annual FWC artificial reef grant applications are due on March 29th. We're hosting a Southwest artificial reef workshop in Palmetto on May 15th. Uh, Lionfish Removal and Awareness Day is going to be uh, here in, in Destin. Uh, and for more, that, more information on that, you can visit reefrangers.com. And we are looking ahead to our next statewide artificial reef summit where we bring all the counties together uh, for a two, two and a half day conference. That's probably gonna be 2020. We're looking for input to, to help us with that. So please visit this uh, Qualtrics uh, site. That survey is going to be open until uh, March 6th. So if there's time for questions, I'll, I'll take those or you can see me during the break or over lunch or anytime after that. Yeah. Hold on. Um, it's on. Okay. Yeah. So we are Facebook living. So when you're asking questions, it will help to, for people who are watching to talk into the mic. So I'll pass that around. Who had a question? Perfect. On your sea dart uh, deployment, has there been a storm event around the sea darts where you can observe how they behave during storm event? Over. Do you mean Nerda or uh, what? Do you, what do you mean? What do you mean sea dart? The sea darts that were deployed. Oh, the sea count. darts. Gotcha. <laughs> gotcha. I was thinking this. Yeah, the reef darts, I think. Correct. The reef darts. Um, uh, so it doesn't, I don't, we don't have that much uh, observations from them yet. So they look pretty, the damage that we've observed appears to all been limited just during construction. There's not much profile to them. So during storm events, there's, there's really not much to uh, that, that movement that we've observed. Hey, Keith, I've got the microphone over here, Bob. Hey, uh, good pictures of those uh, stumps around the shady lady there. Uh, as far as the stumps, I couldn't tell by the photo. Were they inside the depression up on the uh, side of it, or were they pretty much uh, exposed uh, with the rest of this flat sand bottom? The stumps were exposed on the perimeter of the scour hole. So as the scour hole got larger, it exposed those, those stumps. So okay, so it's uh, down below the... It's down in the depression Correct. somewhere. Okay. Okay. Correct. It's a lot. It looks like a lot of sand moved there. Yes, I agree. Keith, what's the anticipated budget uh, for the grants program this year? It's anticipated to be the same, six hundred thousand dollars, and that's going to be um, federal sport fish restoration funds and uh, marine resource conservation trust funds from saltwater licenses. Do you have anticipated timeline of the, I would say the redirected monitoring funds that you said would probably open up in 2020? 
Yeah. So we were trying to get all of that freed up to, to be available starting on July 1. Unfortunately, our legislative budget request cycle, uh, we're only able to free up about, I think, 130,000 of that. So we're going to uh, appropriate that towards Escambia County and then work east for, for the other counties. So Santa Rosa and the others will be receiving the remaining appropriations in 2020-21. And your distribution factors by county is? It will be the same uh, ratios as was implemented for the, for the rest of the NERDA uh, funding. All right, do we have any other questions? We can probably take one more. Okay. Yeah. Is this going to be on a, on a web page? Sorry. Is this going to be on a web page or something like that? Yes. This? You can go to Facebook, Florida Artificial Reefs, and um, Scott Jackson will have that. It might take you a couple it's weeks on, to. No, it's on there right now. It's on there right now. You can watch it today. It's on there now. Oh, the grant the grants are on our FWC uh, website, myfwc.com, Artificial Reefs. Right there, you'll find the uh, the PDF uh, for the grant applications. And as always, we encourage folks to, to try to send us an early draft for us to take a look at. And you know, the more time you give us, the more detail we can get in. But you know, we'll be looking just to make sure that there's nothing blatantly obvious. Uh, you know, things like letters of support, field assess, dive assessments, current dive assessments are always you know highly encouraged. And you know, these are competitively ranked, highly competitive. So the more detail, uh, the better in those uh, grant applications. Thank you, Keith. Okay, so we're gonna go right into our county updates. Um, first, we're gonna do Escambia County. Sure. Oh, okay. While she's doing that, everybody smile and take a picture of y'all. I may use this in another presentation. <laughs> All right. I always need another picture of Bill Horn back there. Yeah. So we have Robert Turpin with the Scambia County. He's going to go ahead and share his process for how he deploys all these artificial reefs. Yeah, I'm going to take you to a very scary place. I'm going to try to take you inside my head uh, when I uh, when I make these decisions uh, about the uh, the artificial reef projects that we do in Escambia County. And um, my contact info is here. I encourage uh, all of you to uh, take these these opportunities to to talk to your your neighbors. Um, in fact, I was talking to Rick O'Connor this morning, and um, we we really like these formats for these artificial reef workshops, and and having them every other year allows us to uh, to to do some meaningful work in the interim. But I was thinking and talking to Rick that that maybe for, for those other county reef coordinators, we might want to just have like a working session uh, on our own uh, and, and be able to share um, experiences, things that worked well, things that maybe didn't work as well and, and come up with some ideas of, of how to work together more regionally. So if you're interested in doing that, um, uh, you know, feel free to contact me and I'll, I'll get with with the rest of the group. If nobody contacts me, I'll realize it was a stupid idea and, and it won't be the first or the last. So, um, but if you, if you do want to get together and, and, uh, and, and discuss some things, then uh, just get with me. One technical glitch real quick. Technical glitch. Yep, of course. For whatever reason. Mm -hmm. You like now? Um, hit share. There okay, we do we have a, does this work? Yeah, you can use that. Too. All right. Back to your presentation. Sorry about that. No worries. I didn't know anything was wrong, so there we go. All right, so uh, Mr. Wines talked to us today about his history with artificial reefing, and, and I guess you're probably uh, 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 a few years ahead of me in, in artificial reefing. I, I worked on my first artificial reef project as a sea scout <clears throat> at Skipper's Diving in 1977. And um, done a lot of stuff. This is back in the day. Uh, the names have been changed uh, and the faces blocked out to, uh, just in case the statute of limitations hasn't worked, uh, hasn't worked its way through on these. But this is the way we used to build reefs. Um, and uh, they were, we were usually doing it, uh, we'd go out and, and build reefs and come in and do some commercial fishing 
uh, on the way back in. Uh, this is back in the 1970s and, and the 80s, and of course things have changed, but um, in the 1990s, 1991, 92, uh, I started working for uh, Dr. Steve Borton when I was doing my undergraduate work at University of West Florida and studying artificial reefs and, uh, and starting to monitor the reefs and, and, and trying to understand how the reefs and the, and the marine life uh, interact. And then uh, when Hurricane Opal came by, I, I started studying how the reef and the physical environment interact. And in my professional life, uh, I had to put a picture of the Oriskany up here. Uh, probably one of the most bittersweet or sweet bitter uh, projects that I've ever worked on. Uh, Keith Milley alluded to the uh, to the uh, continued monitoring that we're having to uh, to do for PCBs, and we are seeing uh, PCBs in in the fish. And uh, the Florida Department of Health uh, issues advisories uh, such as this, and you can uh, see me, or you can go to the Escambia County website for a link to that uh, uh, guideline, but the world's largest artificial reefs and uh, probably one of the, uh, the highlights of my career thus far. Also, we were in Escambia County, um, the, the site for uh, one of the first snorkel reefs in the near shore waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Here you see our, our uh, friendly turtle, or maybe not so friendly, kind of looks like he's frowning, but, uh, but this was one of the first ones in the Gulf of Mexico. And, um, it continues to, uh, to, to be a, a, a thriving uh, reef and providing for our, our community of, of stakeholders. And uh, I think probably the, the thing that, that, that makes, me, uh, makes me know that I've made good choices are the facts that these things are being replicated. And when people are replicating your, your, uh, the work that you're doing, um, you, you realize you're, you're, uh, you're part of a, a greater good. Um, and also part of the, of the greater good is not only the, the technical stuff and our newest uh, addition to a scan County artificial reef monitoring is this new video, Ray. I want to thank uh, Dr. Will Patterson for his, uh, his uh, advice and guidance uh, and also the folks with the Florida Fish and Wildlife. And I didn't have a picture of all of us, but next time I will have this picture to show that, that, uh, that we all as a group uh, work together to to uh, continue to uh, improve our, our understanding of artificial reefs and uh, our ability to build effective uh, artificial reefs. So uh, this is the Scambia County's artificial reef sites in, in total, uh, a large uh, uh, area that has some pretty substantial uh, reef uh, sites in there. Um, but how do we decide what goes where? And this is where I'm gonna Apart from my usual, just using pictures, and I'm gonna I'm gonna use some text slides. I don't like doing it. Uh, I promise you, I won't read them because you can read them for yourself. But these are some of the the considerations that I put into uh, the artificial reef program, and some of them are my considerations. Some of them are permit criteria. Uh, some of them are relevant to my role and responsibility as the county artificial reef manager. Um, and some of you also have input into that as well. Of course, the regulatory issues, those are, those are going to be your, your permit conditions. Uh, and, and those are always uh, in, a, in a state of, uh, of, of primary importance in the artificial reef program. You've got to follow your reef permit conditions. And we need to make sure that we have good permit conditions uh, to, to work with. Um, also, we have uh, various kinds of, of county and, and state procurement policies that we have to follow. Um, our budgeting and, and funding sources, they often have uh, guidelines and considerations and, and controlling factors, as well as, as the safety. And, and, and Commissioner Wines talked about that as well. Safety is a very important par part of our decision making, not only the safety of the people that are building the reefs, but also the people that are using those reefs after they're built. And uh, we've got great risk managers that I've, I've been uh, fortunate enough to work with in Escambia County. Um, and uh, they, they continue to, to provide good guidance. And then just as our, our, our community of, of artificial reef managers, what are our best practices? How are we learning from each other? And, and, and I hope to, to continue to be a part of that. And who are the stakeholders? Well, our traditional, when we think of stakeholders, we traditionally think of our, our, our anglers and our divers. But in your anglers, you've got different anglers that are that are that are out there. You've got charter fishermen, and the charter fishing 
uh, off Pensacola and I would suspect in, in er other areas has changed. It used to be the large head boats and, and, and large charter boats. Now we have more smaller boats that are going and, and they don't have 15 or 20 anglers on the boat. They've got four or five or six anglers on the boat and they have different, uh, different styles and techniques and, and they have different preferences. Some of them are consumptive. Some of them invite the fish home for dinner. Others want to take pictures and, and leave the fish down there uh, for another day. But the other stakeholders include the marine life themselves, our target species. We have threatened and endangered species. We have sea turtles, marine mammals that are in our permit conditions that we have to be uh, aware of, the, the uh, sawfish and, and surgeon. And then also invasive species. So, uh, and, and who knows? But, the, but the, the reefs are going into a biological community, the, the ecosystem. So what are, those, what are those relationships and interactives and how will those, those artificial reefs work uh, within those, those um, ecosystems? Of course, we already talked about the regulatory agents. There are also um, some NGOs out there and, and some, some community groups that, that have some, some input and some great uh, 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 ideas and other maritime in, in industries such as shipping. The folks that go out there and do our beach renourishment, they need sand and those areas sometimes have, uh, have conflicts with that. Oil drilling, oil pipelines, these are all considerations that we really need to, uh, to, to take into consideration. And what are we not thinking of? What's new? What's the thing that we're not going to see until next year or the year after that or the decade after that? So other stuff, uh, others, and, and including in the in the uh, in the the stakeholder preferences are we've already talked about safety, but how much fuel does it take to get out there? How much time does it take for a a, a charter boat to get offshore? What's our quality of life? We're seeing a lot of, especially at Navarre Beach, we're seeing a lot of these uh, reefs are being used by kayak fishermen. They have a completely different style of using these artificial reefs. And what's the carbon footprint? How are, how are the, the utilization of the artificial reefs, uh, how is that factoring into our other ways of, of using um, hydrocarbons? And what's the release mortality? You can build great uh, reefs and in, 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 in deep water, but you got higher uh, release mortality. So what's our depth? No, I'm not gonna make my way through this. Uh, and then the physical and marine environment, you know, you got, you got various kinds of processes and these are, Typically, your stability, durability, um, and and other types of things. The artificial reef manufacturers; these guys have come up with some great ideas, and uh, and they're always looking uh, for the next uh, next improvement. Um, the the consultants, service providers. You got folks out there that are doing uh, side scan sonar that are they're they're building. Um, uh, tools to help you uh, communicate what the reefs look like for your divers and other stakeholders. And what are the new tools and innovations such as the ROV side scan sonar? And how are you building your reefs and what is that going to mean for your reef monitoring? You know, how, how, is, how are you building your, your decisions of how you build your reef? They should be taken into consideration, you know, how you intend to monitor these. And how are you um, building reefs that could be used for uh, research in academia? And replication is a big part of that. And what are the intended and, and sometimes unintended consequences? And what's the next surprise? And sometimes surprises are opportunities. So the decisions at the manager, the artificial reef manager level, where, where are they going to go? Where, where are you going to put these reefs? Where are your reef sites? Where are the reefs within the site? What water depths? What, what are the sizes of the reefs? If you're building out of modules, how many modules are going to go? Uh, what sizes of modules, uh, what's your spacing between modules, you know, what's your patch reef sites, uh, sizes, and planning and preparation. In, in Escambia County, we're building a new Pensacola Bay Bridge. We found out that they were building that bridge over five years ago, and that's when we put in our permit application for an area that would incorporate that. So being prepared gives you a great opportunity to take advantage of, of materials of opportunity. Uh, how many minutes do I have? Three. Okay. All right. Very, very quickly. This is the casino reef. Uh, this is the, the um, NERDA uh, modules. Using GIS has been a fantastic tool. I don't understand GIS as well as I would like to, but I have great interns that, you, that can use this stuff. And, and it's a fantastic tool for helping you plan. You can space them out. You can see on the right-hand side of the screen, those are all the coordinates. 
Um, and this is what it, this is what the patch reefs look like after the construction. And now we've got great GIS uh, uh, receivers on the on the the barges and on the cranes. Uh, this is Escambia Southeast. This is the largest reef site in state waters. Is that right, Keith? Eight square miles. Yeah, this is the one that we put in place for uh, in pre preparation for the Pensacola Bay Bridge uh, deployment, roughly 100,000 tons. But around the outside, you can see these dots here. These are patch reefs. So every 500 feet for over 16 miles, you've got patch reefs every 500 feet. Each patch reef is consists of a large uh, module, one of the 16 footers. And uh, on either side to the north and south consistently placed are the eight footers. And this is as built. So this is the uh, this is part of our our NERDA project. This is what the, the reefs look like on Google Earth. We've got a link on our website now so people can see what these look like on Google Earth. And um, the, the reef manufacturers, we talked about some of the innovations and their willingness to, to uh, work with us. Uh, this is one of the eight foot modules. And if you notice down on the corners, the, the, the windows and the old modules were larger. And what we saw was we saw some scouring. And so working with Stuart and, and, and those folks over there, uh, they were willing to modify those, those designs and we'll be monitoring the, those to see if it works. Uh, reef balls, the, the guys in Pensacola Coastal Reef Builders uh, they incorporated uh, a, a, a little platform at the very bottom of the reef uh, to help it uh, to, to minimize the chance of subsidence. We saw subsidence with reef balls back in the day. And in talking to the guys there in Pensacola, they were perfectly uh, uh, willing to, uh, to, to incorporate a change in design. And we'll be monitoring those as well. Right now, it's looking really good. They're not subsiding as the other ones have. And we talked about the new innovations. This is on uh, the, the, the new uh, Maranatha 2. You've got a GPS uh, receiver on top of the crane and also the vessel has dynamic positioning. So uh, they're able to, to precisely deploy. Uh, this is coastal reef builders. You can see on the center of that spreader bar is a camera. So they're actually shooting video and, and pictures as they're deploying these modules and giving us great as-built pictures. This is what some of the reefs look like after they're built. You've got a large uh, tetrahedron uh, in the center of two small tetrahedrons, and I will leave it there. Thank you all very much. I think we're gonna leave questions till after all the counties present, um, and then we'll also go right into a break. So you can meet up with all the county representatives um, at the break as well. So next we have Santa Rosa. Um, Mike, you're gonna present. Okay. Do I have to go in and press share again? Where's Scott go? Oh no. Okay. Hopefully it's sharing online. All right. Okay. Well, hopefully. Hey, I'm Mike Sandler and uh, I'm with the Navarre Beach Area Chamber of Commerce Foundation. And we'll talk a little bit about Santa Rosa County. Maybe. We'll see. Okay. All right. Anyway, uh, Bar Beach. Uh, we just recently expanded our uh, snorkel reefs. Uh, Robert was talking about uh, the uh, disc mounted pile reefs uh, off of Pensacola Beach. And uh, we thought that was a great idea. And, and so when we put in our first uh, 30 modules back in uh, 2012, uh, they were so successful that we decided, well, we need to head back out there and, and take care of that. And you see these Sergeant Majors, uh, our uh, regular inhabitants. Uh, you can see that, uh, that on these reefs, if you haven't been out and actually looked at one, the amount of growth on these things is incredible. Um, that you can no longer see, see the concrete and limestone and the, uh, the, uh, the creatures that inhabit them uh, are just fantastic. And so uh, we're really happy with those because, okay. Anyway, uh, uh, here's another uh, picture of one of the, uh, the snorkel reefs. And uh, 
uh, obviously a lot of benefits. We won't go, I think most of you realize the benefits of these artificial reefs, uh, but especially close up to shore uh, where snorkelers uh, can easily get to them and divers, uh, Taz back here uh, and Carl, uh, some of the local diving instructors uh, continually take their new students out uh, to these reefs, an ide ideal location to take new divers, novice divers, uh, because of the safety factor that's built in. You go into the county park, you got a place to, you know, to set up all your gear and safely take these folks out and introduce them into the, into the uh, underwater world. You can see nice fuzzy growth on top of these things. Okay. Here's uh, some of our regular inhabitants out on the snorkel reef. Uh, this beautiful green right here, and the uh, and the triggerfish, the remoras up here. Uh, you know, this is just a hundred yards offshore, and it is it is just one of the reasons that our reefs are so popular. These snorkel reefs, people who otherwise could not uh, see these out in the wild, can go out here on a on a nice green flag day and see things like this. Okay, um, one of the presentations yesterday was talking about uh, uh, some of the marine life that is, that is um, you know, uh, really threatened out here. If you look at these blennies hiding in, in here, uh, you see these uh, little creatures that uh, it's almost like gargoyles on the top of a castle. Normally, blennies will live down in the sand the size of your little finger and the creatures will, a lot of creatures will come and eat them up and uh, and so they don't get very big but because of these reefs uh these uh these blennies are are growing in size the population is incredible because they have protection this habitat where habitat previously didn't exist now these blennies are getting huge and we're not talking the size of your little finger anymore we're talking the size of your thumb uh, that they're that they're just huge in here, and uh, and it's all because of these these reefs. And once again, you can see that you you can't see the concrete and limestone because it's replaced by plant and animal life. Another one of our favorites out there uh, on the snorkel reef. Uh, a lot of times you can't see octopus in the daytime, but because these reefs, the way these were designed, create a cave-like environment. Uh, it's not unusual to see our little friends out there. And, uh, and they have a great time. And you can usually find them by the empty shells because octopus are pretty messy. And so they don't clean up after themselves. So if you see a whole bunch of open uh, shells, uh, octopus is probably close by. Okay, here's, uh, so the, uh, you see in this photo, uh, the deployment, the, the center uh, set of reefs, that was our original 30 reefs. And then we expanded on both sides, uh, but as you, maybe are aware that uh, on barrier islands, the sand constantly shifts. And so uh, we had a little bit of a, a problem. We couldn't uh, put the first two, the farthest north uh, reefs on there um, uh, because it was too shallow. Our, the sand was, uh, from the, uh, was constantly moving and some of that sand uh, moved farther south and uh, and so we couldn't have that minimum of six feet of clearance. So uh, this is this is uh, uh, really you can see just barely in the to the north of uh, um, of the uh, on the island there where the park is. It's part of the county park, and there's plenty of uh, vehicle parking, freshwater showers, etc. Okay, here's a, another view of that, and you can see some some uh, snorkelers uh, up there in the front. So here's the uh, 78 structures that are out there just a hundred yards from shore. Okay, here is our one mile out uh, that just got, uh, the deployment just finished up. The uh, Duncan's here, the paperwork is, it, it's so new, the paperwork's not even done on it. Uh, it's, I mean, we're really, it was this month uh, that, that it was finished up. Uh, 27 patch reefs. Uh, out uh, and you can see that uh, that met that line that is in the uh, photograph here uh, to the north. That's the Navarre Beach Pier, and so uh, the permitted area one mile out from shore, one mile deep, two miles wide, and uh, we've just populated the the top half of that, and the the bottom half is available for 
for uh, future expansion. But if you think about it, those folks on the uh, the pier, that pier is 1,600 feet, they're that much closer to the reef. And, uh, and we anticipate there's gonna be a huge, huge uh, increase in the fish population out there. Okay, uh, here's uh, thanks to uh, uh, Taylor Engineering for this photo uh, and uh, the deployment out at that one mile site. Okay, so what went out there? Uh, we put uh, 500, 510 modules of different types out there, uh, 309 of the small uh, pyramids, uh, 22 of the larger, and 179 of the ledge disc uh, configurations for about 2,000 pounds, 2,000 tons of material with a footprint of about uh, 30,000 uh, square feet. Okay, some other things. Some Robert talked about unintended consequences, and one of the unintended unintended consequences we had when we put the snorkel reef in is that it was so popular, people were destroying the sand dunes. So uh, we came up with a with an idea, and uh, and and especially the uh, uh, the kayak community was way behind this program and the um, uh, this uh, beach walkover. Uh, is ideal. It actually gets more use than the regular pavilion walkover, but it includes a uh, washdown station that the kayakers and the scuba divers use on a continual basis, and uh, and it's pretty popular. There's there's Taz in that photo over there, and so this is what it looks like. And you can see the unintended consequences: those rabbit trails over there, and that's what we're trying to prevent is uh, protect that vegetation. Also, the county. Uh, uh, jumped on this, and this is what's called a Moby mat. And so folks with disabilities now can get that much closer down to the beach. And of course, the kayakers and scuba divers enjoy that uh, use of that also, but it's really for those folks who otherwise uh, have a little difficulty getting down to the beach. And we also have an educational program where we take uh, kayakers out in clear bottom uh, kayaks to see the bottom. And we have a fishing rodeo that we do every year. And, uh, and it's a lot of fun out there. And I think with the uh, new reefs that just got deployed, the kayakers are gonna have some great time on this uh, rodeo this year. And uh, lots of kids, we do the kids. And then we also do a program, Take a Kid Fishing, where we give out 300 fishing poles uh, with some educational programs that are involved. And we have our Run for the Reef that we do every year that helps raise funds to make these things possible. So, all right. We got Alex Fogg with Okaloosa County. Thanks a lot. I don't have a pretty presentation, so I'm just going to give you a real quick overview about some of the things we have going on here in Okaloosa County. Um, specifically, starting with the NERDA project, seems like everyone here is talking about NERDA because it's everybody up here gets a lot of money from NERDA. Uh, specifically, we have about $1.7 million that we've separated into two different phases. Uh, the first phase is for the deployment of four different snorkel reefs. Um, that's four of the eight that we're going to be constructing. The other four are going to be uh, deployed with restore dollars, about a million dollars there. The second phase of NERDA is going to be deployed into seven different permitted areas offshore in state waters uh, for 350 or so total reef modules offshore into a number of patch reefs. Each permitted area has a different design though. And I can show you that, uh, offline if anyone's interested. Um, moving into fiscal year, 2018, 19 FWC funds, we were awarded $60,000 for the construction of uh, a number of patch reefs in fish haven 15, which is again, in state waters. We're using that matched with $60,000 from the County to deploy 12 large tetrahedrons. So those big super reefs, uh, it'll be going into four patch reefs from four, three to four modules in each of those. Um, we're also working to permit three additional artificial reef sites in state waters, each about a mile by mile um, boxes. Uh, the reason why we're getting more permitted areas is once we're done with the NERDA project and some of the other state funded projects, we're going to be running out of room and we're going to need more space in state waters to be able to uh, keep up with the demand and uh, all these reefs that we're deploying. Um, another interesting project that we're working on is we're partnering with Eglin Air Force Base and some of the other ranges 
to deploy a, or create a military tribute or a memorial reef um, in state waters again, shallow waters, so that folks can uh, access it to see some of the memorabilia that will be deployed in the form of uh, demilitarized tanks, um, statues, and uh, other plaques and things talking about the contribution of the military here in Northwest Florida. Um, so hopefully that will actually be deployed in one of the new permitted areas that we're working on right now. Um, in addition, we're working with Eglin Air Force Base to uh, continue a relationship that started back in 2015 with the deployment of a whole bunch of um, uh, targets. So there's a lot of weapons testing that goes on up on Eglin Air Force Base, and there's these large concrete targets that get blown up. And when they're done with them, they just sit in a yard. So they're able to get rid of that material for free, and we're able to get free uh, material that we can deploy offshore. The first deployment was back in 2015 at two different locations. The next deployment was in 2017 at two additional locations, and we're hoping to do another one of those deployments over the next year. They have about five or 600 tons of material waiting in a, in a field for us to go pick up and essentially bring offshore. Um, as you heard earlier with Commissioner Wines, we're working on a, uh, a pretty cool project in the FADs that are going to be deployed 60 to 80 miles offshore um, in waters 800 to, I think, 1,500 feet of water. Um, there's going to be very interesting to see how they perform as far as uh, what sort of pelagic fishes they attract, as well as how many people actually use these. Because um, right now, most people are actually going all the way over to Louisiana uh, to the oil platforms to uh, fish for these species. So we'll actually be keeping, keeping them closer to home. Uh, we're also going to be partnering with ReefSmart, which you'll hear a little bit about that in a little bit, to map a number of the reefs that are off of our coast, as well as other areas in the region. Um, I'll let him talk about that in a little bit, probably after all the county updates. Um, and lastly, I guess I couldn't stand up here and not say something about lionfish. So uh, there's a big lionfish event that's going to be held in May and Destin. Uh, so I encourage you all to uh, I guess get with me later or go to the website reefrangers.com or uh, emeraldcoastopen.com to learn more about that. So that's my update. Sorry, I didn't have any pictures or a cool presentation. But if you guys have any questions, let me know afterwards. All right, so Melinda wasn't able to make it to the morning session, but she will be here or she's planning to be here in the afternoon session. So I'm just gonna present for one county here, hopefully. I lost the mouse. Ah. Oh, there we go. Okay. So they've been busy over the past two years. Um, her information is on the screen, hopefully. Okay. Um, so they've been busy over the past two years with NERDA as well as SFR funds. Um, in 2017, they started and completed all of their construction for NERDA. They deployed 262 modules um, in about 16 permitted sites. They did four snorkel reefs and their idea of their snorkel reefs, they did little marine theme designs. So they have a seahorse, a dolphin, a turtle and a fish. So their idea is that when people go to access it off of shore, it'll be easier to kind of or orient themselves so they can see all of the reef um, as they're snorkeling it. They plan to put in signage right off the beach to help find the reefs from shore, as well as navigational pilings to line up when you're right above the right over the reef um, to help assist finding those reefs. Um, so yeah, oh, also they celebrated with a cake, you know, it's a big accomplishment, a lot of money going into these projects. Um, so it's good that they had fun with it afterwards. <laughs> um, last year, uh, they were funded by FWC to deploy 48 modules in one of their, um, they, the top sale near shore site, that's one of their NERDA reefs as well. Um, so they are using their NERDA permitted sites for additional material. Um, and also, and you can kind of see they did two projects in one. They had our SFR modules as well as what I'm going to talk about a little later, their underwater art museum reef, uh, snorkel reef. Um, coming up, they were funded again uh, for 44 modules this time in the in a little bit deeper site, the Miramar site, um, and they that will be with. F WC funds as well as some restore funds. So in addition to NERDA funds, they, they have some restore funds that they are using as well. 
Um, and with all this money coming in, they are working on new permits, new permitting sites. Uh, so they have one large area that they have authorized, one nautical mile by five nautical miles. Um, their previous 16 permitted sites were only a quarter nautical mile by quarter nautical mile. So um, they those have pretty much been filled with NERDA funds. Um, and so they wanted a larger area for a lot of future deployments. And lastly, something that Keith kind of touched upon, but also they're working with their nonprofit, South One Artificial Reef Association. Uh, this will be a continuing project annually, but last year they deployed seven unique sculptures. Uh, this is one of them in the lower right. Uh, I think if you recall Keith's presentation, they had like a skull and a pineapple and a deer and a few others. Uh, these are done by both local and international artists. It's a competition, so they they submit their designs, they go through picking them out, and then they construct them and deploy them. Uh, so this year, it looks like they've received 36 entries, um, and they'll probably narrow that down to about uh, five or seven sculptures uh, for this coming year. And that's the website. You can find more information about the artists as well as the material and how they constructed their, their modules. So like I said, Melinda should be here in the afternoon. So lastly, I think we have Bay County. Um, Alan Golden's going to present. Uh, he has a lot going on, I know, as well. And then we'll go into some questions in our break. Okay, in, in Bay County, Hurricane Michael hit in October 10th, 2018, and caused a lot of damage to our county. Uh, days after the storm, aerial photographs were taken, and uh, they were added to our GIS maps. Uh, Unified Command came in uh, with a $18.5 million budget to remove they targeted 1,378 1, vessels that were impacted by the storm. And uh, the vessels were either touching the water at high tide, they were misplaced by the storm, or they were underwater. And uh, most of the owners with insurance removed almost half of the vessels. The uh, Unified Command removed 544 vessels and uh, hauled them off to the landfill. Uh, the owners were devastated by the loss of their, their vessels. Um, the last on their list was the El Dorado. It was, um, you just have the, uh, okay. The El Dorado was sitting in about three feet of water next to the uh, FSU campus. And you could see it from the Hathaway Bridge. So all of the first responders and, and all of the uh, construction workers that were crossing the bridge could get to see the El Dorado sitting out there in the grasses for months. Um, the, the Unified Command worked with the, uh, the boat owner and uh, they were going to remove the boat, the vessel, and uh, either the owner could pay for the recovery cost or, uh, or uh, just relinquish the uh, vessel to the, uh, the county. And uh, hopefully the county would, uh, would get the uh, recovery cost waived. So um, we had an opportunity, so I called Keith Milley. And uh, Keith helped and assisted the county in uh, getting the uh, owner to transfer the title to the county. And uh, we met with the Unified Command and they waived their recovery cost. So uh, they, they uprighted the vessel, they parbuckled the vessel, uh, floated the vessel over to St. Andrews Marina and then they delivered the vessel to the county. And uh, on uh, 
on January 15th, the county sent out an RFP for the uh, cleaning and the deployment of uh, the El Dorado as an artificial reef. We're planning on putting it next to the DuPont bridge span about 12 miles out. That's February 15th. February 15th. Yeah. So just last week. Oh, oh yeah, February 15th. And uh, that's when the uh, Coast Guard and FWC and uh, Global Diving and Salvage transferred the vessel to the county and delivered it to us. Luckily, the, the vessel was already prepped and cleaned and uh, and there's gonna be a little bit of cleanup and, uh, and uh, a deployment plan for the vessel. Um, on Friday of this week, I'm gonna meet with anybody that uh, wants to have a proposal prepared to submit to the county for the uh, cleanup and the deployment of the vessel. So we're gonna have a tour of the vessel for the proposals. At 10 a.m. on Friday. Okay, next is the uh, update on the NERDA contract. Uh, Bay County was awarded uh, $918,000 and uh, we, we partnered with Mexico Beach and we uh, added a, uh, a permitted site uh, through Mexico Beach to our NORDA agreement. And uh, we sent out an RFP for the first phase of the NORDA site, which is 120,000 to deploy uh, the uh, uh, super reefs or reef modules, large reef modules. And uh, I think we're gonna place about nine super reefs and uh, 16 smaller reef modules in the uh, Sherman site. The uh, RFP is in process and we, we should hear some information from the uh, Board of County Commissioners soon on the, on the uh, contract award. Um, we're also working with uh, FW, FSU on uh, surveying the uh, the original proposed uh, sites for NORDA, the uh, SARS, the small area artificial reef sites E through L. And uh, we, we ran into a snag uh, years ago. SHPO wanted us to do a cultural survey of the bottom areas on that reef, reef on those proposed reef sites. So again, I called Keith Milley and he helped us out. Uh, FWC uh, surveyed the sites for us and then uh, assisted us with, get, with getting the right equipment to do the survey. And uh, last summer, I worked with FSU and we pulled a uh, side scan sonar and a magnetometer to do a cultural survey. We, uh, we found two chicken coops and uh, we dove and took pictures of them. Um, Mark Fulner is uh, with FSU. He, he completed a, uh, a report for us uh, of our findings. And we also dove on the SS Tarpon, which was close to our proposed reef sites. And uh, it's a shipwreck that's been out there for a while. I think uh, uh, the Tarpon was uh, a uh, historical reef site that was documented and recorded. And uh, we didn't want any of the, uh, the debris from the tarpon to be in any of our proposed reef sites. So we, uh, we dove and, and uh, surveyed the area around the SS tarpon while we were doing this uh, report. Okay, the next, uh, uh, Reef project that we were working on is the Restore Act. In December of 2018, the Treasury awarded Bay County $442,000 to deploy um, about a thousand tons of uh, concrete and steel uh, materials of opportunity. And uh, we're going to start. Uh, 
writing the permits and submitting the applications for 10 artificial reef sites pretty close to the uh, to the St. Andrews Bay Pass in state waters. And those are our, uh, our proposed artificial reef sites. And they're gonna be called SARS uh, M through V. Okay, uh, Keith Milley, he, uh, he stole our thunder and uh, he presented some of the reef deployments of, of last summer, our, our construction projects. This is the uh, hopper barge. It's 75 feet long, 35 feet wide, about 17 feet tall. Uh, we took it out there and uh, about 35 miles out and we, uh, we put some ports in it and uh, the ports were a little, a little bit too high above the water line. So we pumped water into it for hours and hours and hours. And we sat there on a nice calm day out in the middle of the Gulf. And yeah, and uh, we got the water up above the ports and then it went down pretty fast after that. But uh, what a fantastic project uh, to get a, yeah. It's a good project. Okay, uh, the next uh, construction project that we did last summer was the uh, Danny Grizzard. Uh, it was a 65 foot long Navy uh, uh, reef research dive vessel. And uh, the Danny Grizzard works with PCMCI and uh, a group of volunteers cleaned up the boat, got all the uh, all, all the materials out of it, cleaned it up, and they uh, they did the same thing. Um, we tethered this vessel to uh, an army tank that we put out there in 1998. Been out there for a long time, but uh, the stability of the the vessels that you put out there are very important. And we got we found out that how important that was because when the storm through blew through the uh, the the tank held the vessel in place it banged it up a little bit and the vessel wound up on the other side of the tank but it stayed attached and it didn't wash away from the uh, the uh, permitted area so it turned out to be a good project and that's definitely a good way to stabilize the uh, the reefs the ships that are, that need anchoring is to anchor them to something that's pretty stable so they'll stay secure. Um, we're, we're trying to help out the, uh, the private funded reef deployments in Bay County. A lot of the fishermen and the divers have been devastated by the storm and they're asking me if they can deploy some uh, some private reefs to uh, to get that are easily accessible and um, close to the pass so they can uh, get their businesses up and running again. So uh, we're working with uh, some near shore uh, existing reef areas that maybe needs to be author reauthorized and uh, we can put together some uh, some privately funded reef deployments in uh, some areas that are pretty close to the past to help these guys get back in business. Uh, Scott and I went around to the marinas and took pictures of uh, the, the uh, and talked to the, uh, the fishermen and the divers after the storm and uh, they're pretty much wiped out. Uh, the marinas were devastated and the, uh, the fishermen are having a hard time recovering from the storm. So anything that we can do to help those uh, guys out and get them back in business is, is appreciated. So that's about all I have. Stay here. So if we can all the reef Come managers come, come up. Um, we're just going to do some quick questions. We have about five or 10 minutes for some questions. Um, some Q&A for you guys.
perfect carol <laughs> Alex, you mentioned some uh, free materials at Tyndall, and um, so they got rid of the material for free, and y'all got it for free, but what kind of logistics were involved in getting those material from the base out into the Gulf? So I haven't actually been involved with the full deployment yet. Um, we're working through those right now to get, uh, I guess it's really a contract with Eglin Air Force Base to allow contractors to go on and grab the material to bring to either our staging area or directly to wherever the barge may be. Um, so that'll probably happen over the next year or so, but with the one in 2017, um, I think there was like you guys, you guys worked with that, correct? Yeah. Duncan and Taylor did, a, did the majority of those, uh, worked, worked through the majority of those logistics. Yeah. So I don't have a good answer. Yeah. We essentially just had the contractor go on to Eglin Air Force Base and then, you know, grab the materials and then they hauled them to a staging area, um, which actually Vulcan materials and um, then they loaded them, you know, onto the deployment vessel and then took them out. There was still probably a pretty good cost involved with it. Yeah, there was, yeah. yeah it, there's definitely cost involved in the, the double handling. Uh, to caveat on Carol's question there, where's the uh, funding coming for that project? Is it uh, joint uh, from the community in Eglin or? So 2017, I believe FWC put money forward as well as money from the county. Um, okay. And then in the future, it's going to be the county. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Perfect. Laura. My question is regarding snorkel reefs. Uh, we have the four new beautiful snorkel reefs in Walton County, and we're going to be getting some in Okaloosa. Uh, have visited the Navarre uh, reefs before. Are there some best management practices when it comes to installing the snorkel reefs? Because my concern is a lot of our snorkel reefs in Walton County are fairly far from the beach, and I worry about safety concerns of some people not being good swimmers uh, trying to get out there. Uh, by swimming from the beach instead of using a kayak or a stand-up stand paddleboard. So I didn't know, I know there's certain depth requirements that the snorkel reefs have to be in. I was wondering if there's a requirement as far as how far from shore for safety. That's a really great question. And that's one of those balancing acts that we as artificial reef managers have to, uh, have to do. Uh, obviously we've got permit conditions, we've got minimum clearances. Also, one of those unintended consequences of, of sand moving across the areas. We built our first one off of Escambia County in a north-south direction, and we built it about 500 feet offshore. Um, and we, we use signage and we use outreach and education, letting folks know not only do you need a dive flag, but you need to consider that, that uh, those, those other safety concerns. Um, one thing that I forgot to mention, I want to make sure I mention it because Eileen is here, is Escambia County, we have a Marine Advisory Committee that meets wow. monthly, and that's a great way for us as reef managers to hear about our, our uh, stakeholder needs and preferences is through those Marine Advisory Committees. But, but you're right, that's, that's going to be a, 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 big, a, a big consideration. Our second reef that we, we permitted uh, in the Gulf of Mexico near Casino Beach is actually a little bit closer offshore. We don't have, we can't put the full component of, of verticality to the reef. And we also understand that it may cover up uh, as some of our other reefs have. Thanks, Robert. Hi. Uh, can anybody comment on a difference in cost to a snorkel reef versus some of your more uh, deeper projects? Is it a, is there a discernible difference in the cost being that it's in shallower water? Is it the same? Uh, uh, so there are uh, uh, different types of, of reef. It's a completely different structure. So the snorkel reefs, because they're in such shallow water and such a, uh, uh, a, an exposed area close to shore, they're more subject to uh, the, the surf conditions and, and uh, you know, uh, water. Think about if a big storm comes in and all that force that's coming in close to shore, so those structures that, that we have are pile mounted. And so, um, uh, and so when it comes to deploying them, 
uh, the uh, vessel that puts them in uh, has to wait for perfect conditions to put those in because they're so close to shore. They don't want that big that big barge ending up on the beach because it would be really expensive to get that off. Uh, and and the, the, uh, obviously they're less expensive because they are uh, they're smaller in size. So uh, the pile mounted discs uh, weigh about, and uh, Stuart can correct me, but about 3,000 pounds in that, in that range. And so they're, they're put in uh, individually, whereas uh, the, the pyramids, uh, you know, are, are in the five and 10,000, you know, pound range and, and larger. So the, the cost is, you know, is kind of based on the, on the size. Did that answer your question? Are the snorkel reefs uh, marked and lighted? I'm concerned about hazard to navigation, how you overcame that. We have some in the Gulf that we, when we consulted with the Coast Guard, they did not, uh, they did not need to be uh, marked with, with buoys or pétons. Um, the ones in the bay are, uh, we have some in the bay as well, and those are uh, pile-mounted signs with lights, but they're all charted. We work with uh, National Ocean Service to chart everything. I'm wondering about, uh, has anybody looked at beach restoration, like in the Lower Beach particularly, with the snorkel reefs out there? Um, they dredge in sand to build up the beaches, and then it gets washed back out there and, you know, starts to cover up the reefs or that, that uh, you know, starts getting shallower. I'll, I'll, I'll answer about Escambia County because that was one of the considerations, but I'll let him... Have the same. Yeah, but sand normally moves east to west, and we actually, when we design them, we designed them so that they would not function as a groin. So we allowed them, we allowed the natural processes to occur. I'll let you finish up with that. Yeah, so the, uh, you know, unintended consequences, and, and so when, when our original uh, 30 uh, snorkel structures were, were put in, uh, you know, they were in nine feet of water. And so they had plenty of clearance, that hazard to navigation, somebody had mentioned a requirement that uh, six feet below the surface at low tide for the highest point that, that sticks up, just so you know. Uh, but yeah, the sand moves. And, uh, and so those, those first few rows kind of continually get sandblasted, but we, we figure that, you know, in several years, they'll be back out of the sand. And, um, you know, uh, the newer ones that we put in are the additional uh, reefs that were deployed, uh, we backed uh, a, a few, several feet to the, several yards to the uh, to the south. So we didn't have those first few rows because of that sand that was coming off. All right, any more questions? We can probably take one more. Perfect. Thank you guys. And like I said, we're, <laughs> we'll be here all day so go ahead and feel free to catch up with them um it's 10 40 we're gonna go and take a 20 minute break and re re meet at 11.
until the next, uh, uh, until lunch actually. And um, we are going to invite up uh, to speak and give us updates the, the easternmost uh, area of this region. So with this, I'd like to um, introduce uh, Bob Cox with the Mexico Beach Artificiaries. I think most of you know who I am. Welcome this morning, and uh, I'm Bob Cox from the Mexico Beach Artificial Reef Association. We're an all-volunteer organization uh, taking the lead in Mexico Beach uh, with uh, permitting processes, building reefs, and monitoring them. Uh, uh, recent accomplishments over the last couple of years, we uh, completed our $1.4 million NERDA phase, uh, phase three project. We did that inside of 12 months. We started in 2016 and wrapped it up in April of uh, 2017. And then after that, in April, we had a $60,000 grant from FWC, along with other uh, private and matching funds that we applied towards the grant for $146,000. And we also added another $22,000 in memorial reefs. Our memorial reef program is really becoming popular, and it's nothing to have about four to uh, half a dozen memorial reefs going out with every deployment now. This was our uh, deployment back uh, to the grant deployment. That was uh, the Mar Marinantha II. It was the first time we used it over in our area. Uh, did a great job. Uh, one thing I've got to say, it's a great crane on there and the dynamic positioning system on there was awesome. I mean, the accuracy and being able to keep uh, the vessel stable uh, compared to their first vessel, Marinantha uh, One, is it's, it's amazing. Uh, construction pending, as uh, Alan Golden alluded to, we have a $120,000 NERDA project coming from Bay County that we're going to be deploying in the uh, four patch reefs in the uh, Sherman site. And uh, something that's next on the horizon, uh, we, Walter Marine ha also has also offered this uh, uh, ca old casino vessel that's in Louisiana. The history back on that's uh, back in the days uh, before Hurricane Katrina, the only way you could really operate a uh, uh, casino, it was offshore, so these ves types of vessels were popular, but, but during Katrina, they became battering ramps, so the uh, Mississippi and Louisiana changed their policies on that, started putting cas uh, casinos on land, so they will have these big battering ramps sitting out there in the water when a hurricane comes through. So now these vessels are surplus, and this one's up for a million dollars, prepared and sunk, and we... Uh, Got some pled, uh, MBRA is gonna contribute 80,000 towards this project. Uh, we got St. Joe Community uh, Foundation that's gonna contribute 50,000. And plus we got about another 10,000 in uh, private local donations uh, pledged towards this project. We took that and applied, uh, sent in a pre-application to Gulf Coast Triumph. Uh, they came back and said, uh, we like what you're uh, proposed and we'll go ahead and submit a full application. So it's looking pretty promising, but uh, hopefully, you know, by the time uh, this time next year, we'll have a better idea of whether that's going to happen or not. There's what the uh, vessel looks like now. It's sitting in Louisiana, 210 feet, 66 width, height of 70 feet. You may have to take the wheelhouse off to meet uh, uh, surface uh, to reef top uh, requirements, and it's almost 2,200 2, tons. Reef monitoring, uh, 2017, we accomplished uh, 62 and posted those on our website. And in 2018, we did 43. And in 2019, we're going to do as many as possible, especially in the Bell Shoals area, because uh, as uh, Jeff Renchen will mention later on this afternoon to show you a lot of things with uh, some of the Hurricane um, Michael assessment, we're going to really focus on that area. And we have a lot to learn there as far as what a storm can do to our reef modules. And also, as uh, Keith showed in one of the pictures, the Shady Lady, it uprighted, and that vessel sits in 95 foot of water. It, it, we sunk it back in 2007, went down on the side, and it was on its side until Michael came along. Okay, here's a uh, map of what our uh, reef permit sites are. The ones in blue are the ones we have in state waters. These uh, five squares out in the uh, uh, Federal waters we have there, and the Lars A and Lars B belongs to Bay County, but in the past we have deployed some of our uh, funding out in the uh, Lars B site as well. And I'll uh, hold questions uh, just like we did with the uh, 
the uh, earlier group uh, until all the uh, associations are done. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. I'd like to invite uh, Gratian Shepard up to give us an update on some of uh, Franklin County's uh, artificial reef activities. Well, I'm Grayson Shepard. I'm from Apalachicola. In my defense, I didn't know I was on the agenda until Keith kind of showed it to me a little while ago. But um, unfortunately, I don't have anything to show up here because I don't have anything in the water down there. We uh, just formed our Artificial Reef Association two weeks ago. That's going to be the Apalachicola Artificial Reef Association, the AARA. I wanted to call it the Apalachicola Artificial Reef Project, but somebody had already used AARP, so uh, I can't do that one. But uh, we have submitted an application for a reef site uh, in state waters, about eight and a half miles, roughly due south of the Bob Sykes Cut, if you guys are familiar with that area, off of St. George Island, in state waters, so uh, it'll hopefully be accessible to state charter captains. There's a lot of, you know, smaller bay boat type captains that'll be able to run out there on a good day and, and hopefully let some of their people catch snappers or, or whatnot. Um, like I said, we don't have anything yet. We're in the permitting process. As soon as we get something, uh, you know, made some contacts here. In fact, uh, Jim with Reef Innovations generously donated our very first reef ball. We'll probably do a deployment this weekend. And uh, so I'll keep you guys monitored on how, how that goes. But Looking forward to being back here next year. Hopefully I will be able to give a real report, maybe with a picture of something that we can put up here so I can kind of join the crowd. I'm happy to be here and uh, looking forward to seeing you guys next year. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Grayson. Uh, next we have uh, Bill Horn to give us a, an update from the city of Carabelle, Wakulla County Organization for Artificial Reefs uh, area. So uh, welcome, Bill Horn. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I also got the last minute notice here of, of coming, so I have a, a wonderful presentation as well. Um, my name is Bill Horn. Uh, after finally coming to my census for 22 years, working with Keith Milley in the state program, I, I went to consulting in the, in the uh, private sector. So that's what I do now. So with OR, the order for, I wear a lot of hats. I work with a lot of people. I've worked with Bay County to help them with their, their permitting of their large area work with Walton County to those, those uh, snorkel sites. I, I actually designed those using my mapping program. That was a lot of fun. It was like connecting the dots. It was really fun. Uh, but with OR, I'm their designated uh, visiting consultant. So now I'm wearing my OR hat. Um, they're not too busy. OR is a, one of the oldest uh, artificial reef associations in the state. They were founded in the mid 80s, believe it or not. Uh, they. Their priorities are Wakulla County, St. Mark's, and working with the city of Carabell. They've been managing their, these are very, very small counties. They don't have the staff or the resources to deal with artificial reefs. They'd rather deal with sewer problems and road problems and things like that. So, or uh, helps them with their permitting, with their diving, with their uh, grant applications. And uh, we've been doing that for quite a while. Uh, we haven't done anything recently. The last two grants we submitted to FWC, unfortunately, were turned down and we didn't get the funding. Uh, FWC uh, or gets their funding mainly through grants. It, like I said, it's a nonprofit group. It's a very small group, um, but they have a group of dedicated board members. <clears throat> Alan Richardson is the uh, president and he wished he could have come. But he also wishes you'd have these meetings on weekends instead of the weeks because he can't miss two days of work to get here. So he sends me to talk about it. Um, we, we've got several sites, uh, active sites, even though we're not deploying, we're always working on keeping active sites. You can't build an artificial reef unless you have an active permit site. So we have two sites off of Carabelle. One's a deeper site and about 60 feet of water. <laughs> the water's not real deep over there compared to over here. Um, and that's the uh, 10 mile, Carabelle 10 mile site, 10 mile, 10 miles out. And then there's a, a smaller site, St. Teresa's site, about 40 feet of water. And they deployed back in 2016. That was basically the last deployment in that area. Um, and, and then in Wakulla County, the St. Mark's Reef was the most recent deployment over there in 2016. But we did get a new permit in that area, the, the marker 24 permit we got approved last year. And we will be submitting a grant application for that. 
uh, to get some materials out there. We have some materials of opportunity we would like to put out there. And uh, we are actively permitting another site, uh, the city of St. Mark's, just to prove the application for a new permit for the, for the dog Ballard Reef. So as soon as I get back on Friday, I'll spend that out to Lisa. Hope, hopefully Lisa's here. <laughs> You'll be getting it from me <laughs> probably Monday, not by Friday, but probably about Monday. Um, so we're staying busy, we're staying active. Uh, like I said, there's a dedicated group of uh, volunteers. It's kind of hard to keep the volunteers active, but uh, they enjoy what they're doing and uh, we'll take any questions. Thank you. Yeah, so if we can have Grayson and, and Bob uh, come back up and we'll, then we'll, uh, we'll welcome any questions from the audience. Come on, guys. I walked all the way back up there. Fire. <laughs> oh, no. Thanks, I, Robert. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I really don't have a question, but I did want to uh, express my gratitude to see you guys and, and the amount of volunteering that y'all do is, is phenomenal. Um, I know what this costs in terms of dollars if we were to go out and contract that work. So I just want to thank y'all. Thank you. I know, I just want to say, I kind of feel like the redheaded stepchild between these two, because if you guys look at the FWC map of artificial reefs and you look at Mexico Beach, I mean, it's it's awesome. In Barra, you guys have done incredible work. And then, or off of the Carabelle area, which is to my east, and uh, I don't know how many you guys have over there, but there's a pile over there. And right there in the middle is Apalachicola, and we're known for oysters, and that's about it. And uh, there's really only two little sites that are in state waters that are offshore from Apalachicola. One of them was deployed in 1965 and it was a handful of culverts. And then the Franklin Reef was uh, part of the old bridge between East Point and Apalachicola. That was 1983. The last artificial reef deployed off of St. George Island was 15 years ago. And it was some of the old bridge spans between East Point and, and St. George Island. I've been a charter captain for 20 years over there and uh and basically what what did it was one of walter marine's barges i believe it was going under the bridge of apalachicola heading over to carabelle to to drop some reef balls and it just rubbed me raw i'm sitting there <laughs> i'm looking at this barge full of this beautiful stuff just go right on by apalachicola and i jumped on the radio and i asked the guy where are you taking it he goes oh we're taking it over there to the other side of carabelle i'm like nope nope that's not gonna work so I went to the county commission and, uh, and sat down with some of those guys, and, and here we are now. That's three years later, and it's taken this long for, uh, for me to kind of single-handedly get the community behind it. And now we've kind of got a snowball rolling down the hill. And uh, like I said, we don't have a dime. I'm going to apply for the, the FWC permit if I get our permit in time. But um, till then, we're going to do a bake sale at the Piggly Wiggly. If anybody <laughs> wants to come to Apalachicola and help, you know, I appreciate it. Like I said, I'll see you guys next year. I'll have better better report for that. Um, the funding the funding issue is really important, and I meant to talk about it. Um, besides the grants, another funding opportunity that has been very important for or re more recently in recent years, and certainly Mexico Beach or memorial reefs. People want to build reefs uh, to memorialize somebody that's passed, and so that's a very important funding source. It's a very important thing to do. Uh, Walter Marine uh, does a lot of memorial reefs and of course reef balls, the internal reefs do the same thing. So, so that's an opportunity for funding as well that needs to be kept in mind. Yeah, to caveat on some of that funding there, uh, where we get to uh, generate, we do things like the annual kingfish tournament. And that's a big, uh, we get about 140 to 200 boats there and people have a good time and it's all to support a good cause. It's, it's a charity fundraising event is what it is. All right, any last questions? All right. Well, you're all too easy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. Um, we have a, a few minutes ahead of schedule. So before uh, Lisa comes up, well, I'd like to invite Peter from uh, Reef Smart to, uh, to say a few words about some of the projects that, that his company has been working on. I think it's uh, appropriate to uh, 
Um, and that maybe I can open up your little slide here. Scott, let me know if I need to push anything else. Is that, are we broadcasting this uh, okay? Okay. Um, so I'll, I'll give Peter a few minutes to kind of introduce himself and, uh, and share with us uh, some of the work you've been doing. Thanks, Nick. And uh, thanks for squeezing me in at the Good. last minute. Sure. Seems like a lot of folks sure. were squeezing the last minute. Great. Share. Um, sure. Share. Oh, that's what they were not doing. Excellent point. So um, my company, uh, uh, we make these uh, underwater, we map reefs and wrecks. We wrap, uh, we map reefs and wrecks. Uh, we also create these dive guidebooks and that's what's brought me to this region. Um, I've been talking with Alex Fogg for uh, a couple of months now. We've been trying to arrange um, a partnership with, uh, through a bunch of the counties so that we can create these dive guidebooks. We've got ones for Fort Lauderdale, Bonaire, Barbados. We've got ones coming out from Palm Beach County. Um, and what we're trying to do is uh, create a, a partnership of the folks here um, to really uh, enhance the, the awareness of the diving in a given region. Um, we, as you can see, those are some of our titles we have now. Um, we're, we're expanding to Palm Beach, Cayman. We're in talks with a lot of other areas, um, including Cozumel um, and, and even uh, Grenada, St. Lucia, some of the Caribbean islands. Our main focus right now is in the Caribbean. Um, and, and we basically, some of you may have seen, um, we, we do the uh, underwater wrecks. Um, we do um, natural reefs as well. Um, specifically here, there's, I think there's a lot of opportunities. You guys are doing a, a lot of incredible work in, in enhancing the diving in the area um, through a lot of the artificial reefs, the snorkel reefs. Um, and it's something that we're really interested in, in trying to partner with you all to, to um, kind of pull together into a book, something that really can can help put the panhandle onto the proverbial diving map. Um, and so I'll be around through lunch uh, if you guys have any questions. Um, and that's my contact information as well. So thanks again, Keith, for uh, the opportunity. Thank you, Peter. Next on the agenda is uh, Lisa Lovern from the Army Corps of Engineers and the, the Panama City office. So we appreciate you joining us today and sharing with us uh, some of the regulatory updates that a lot of us uh, need to stay aware of. Sounds good. All right, we'll get your presentation going here in just a moment. So just in case any of you don't know me, um, my name is Lisa Lovern. I work in the Panama City permit section. Um, we are currently um, orphans and moving around, but we are about to get into our new office. So uh, it will be out on the beach. I don't know if any of you have uh, come to visit us over on 23rd Street, but uh, you'll have to go a little bit further now. We're gonna be out on the beach at the corner of Richard Jackson and uh, Hutchinson Boulevard. So I did update our slide and these will be available. Um, the phone numbers are still being worked out. We haven't got our IT and everything going yet. So um, bear with us. Uh, email is the best. I can give you all my email address. It'll be in here as well. So uh, again, Lisa Levin. And uh, I was asked to uh, talk about applying for permits as well as giving a JAXPO update for that is for uh, the National Marine Fisheries Service for their endangered species. We have a programmatic that we're able to use, which is great. Um, as long as you are designing your reef within those parameters and, and you'll see those soon. Space? Good. Okay, and as I just talked about, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, the Corps Authority and liability, that's a big one. Um, talk about our application process as well as permit considerations for state for endangered species. Uh, we have some standard special conditions that we have for reef projects that we have for the Jacksonville district as a whole. So uh, we'll look at those and last but not least, compliance and enforcement. So really don't have to tell anyone here, we're all here for the same reason. And the fact that artificial reefs are great habitat. They're not only good for enhancing our fisheries, but they're also really good economic back, uh, benefit for our coastal counties. And again, I'm not gonna read all the slides, so. Going into our core authority, um, we have the Rivers and Arbors Act. And with that, uh, it's, we're responsible for navigation. And so uh, our jurisdiction, federal jurisdiction, extends from the coastline to 200 nautical miles. 
Um, for some of you that work directly with the state, that's obvious a difference because the state, their jurisdiction goes out to nine nautical miles. So a bit of a difference. Um, another authority that we are responsible for is the Clean Water Act. And with that, it's uh, section 404. Um, the 404 is uh, for a discharge of fill. Um, our jurisdiction for artificial reefs in the, in the Gulf extends three nautical miles out. So if your proposal is for three nautical miles, you, you would get a dual permit from the Corps, which would be a section 10 permit, as well as a section 404. Um, most reefs are further out. So um, you would still need to get a core permit, but it would only be under section 10, not section 404. The state permit considerations, as I just stated, their jurisdiction goes out to nine nautical miles. So uh, for the core, for federal purposes, we have to ensure that the projects uh, abide by the, the Coastal Zone Management uh, Consistency Act. And so uh, mainly the state is responsible to give us that, that certification, if you will. In some cases, state permits aren't required. So in those cases, the Coastal Zone Management uh, Consistency Act certification still may be required. And if it is, usually that process takes about 60 days. Fun, 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 fun. Permitting, everybody loves it. So just a real quick run through with this is we get a permit application, uh, verify a programmatic general permit. These are permits that we have gone into with whether it be a county or the state, but these are programmatic permits that they authorize on our behalf. Currently, we have nothing that will address artificial reefs. So we move on to the next one, which would be a regional general permit or a nationwide permit. Again, locally in the state of Florida, we currently do not have any re regional general permits and we do not have any nationwide permits that will address artificial reefs. So lo and behold, you get pushed into a standard permit. These permits, there are major permits. These take approximately 120 days to process. However, we do have ESA situations where sometimes the consultation takes a little bit longer. In um, some other cases, we get requests back for cultural resource surveys. Um, so uh, sometimes uh, those logistics, it takes just, it takes a bit longer. But with the standard permit, we're gonna put out a public notice. We wanna let everybody know what's going on, what's being proposed in their waters. Um, Tracy's gonna address that shortly. Again, we have a lot of things that we have to abide by. The 404B1 guidelines, those have to do with the Clean Water Act. Again, that's with the reef that's within three nautical miles, three nautical miles from the shoreline. Um, we have to look at public interest review. Those go back to, I'm not sure who was talking about safety. We have to look at uh, economics. There's a lot of different parameters that we have to look at and address. Also, obviously compliance with NEPA, um, the ESA, his, uh, historic properties, essential fish habitat. There's a numerous, numerous amount of laws that we have to look and ensure that we're abiding by. And then this rarely happens. I don't know, I can count on one hand that I've seen that happen. Application approved and we move on to a permit issue. And just to let you know, normally, core permits, the initial permit is authorized for 10 years. Before you wanna apply, we need to look at liability. Um, in any case, anyone comes to the core asking for a permit, that applicant on that page is responsible. They're responsible if it fails, they're responsible if somebody dies. There's a liability factor. In most cases with artificial reefs, we normally have governmental entities that will that will uh, apply. And the reason being is because normally they claim sovereign immunity or they are uh, self-insured. And so that is the way that we are able to permit that. Um, Alan mentioned earlier private, um, private deployments. Keep in mind those private deployments are within Bay County's reef, permitted reef area. Something happens, unfortunately, Bay County has to take it um, as far as there, you know, if there's any kind of uh, enforcement. Items for a complete application. I know lots of you have probably applied. Um, we have an ENG three-page form, very easy. Um, we broke out from the state joint process, which was approximately 42 pages. So we have a three-page, um, good, 
project description. Why are you wanting the reef? What are you trying to get from it? What uh, species are you trying to, to you know, generate? Um, adjacent property owners and addresses. Normally that is not an issue because these things are out in deep water. Um, we have our regular agencies that we have to, um, that we coordinate with, as well as uh, some other entities, non-governmental entities. And again, Tracy will address that. Statement avoidance minimization, as well as a compensatory mitigation statement. Those are only required if you are building your reef within three nautical miles from the shoreline, because that is our 404 jurisdiction. Uh, again, set of drawings. Yes, we're a little primitive. We need eight and a half by 11. If you have to piecemeal it, um, then, you know, just piecemeal it. But that's the, that's, that's the size that we can accept. Um, overall site plan, um, you don't have to worry about the wetland boundaries. And the big uh, difference for artificial reef applications versus a regular application is we have uh, several uh, NOAA items that we have to get because we have to chart with them, as, as most of you know. And we'll go on that in just a second. Everybody knows there's several uh, guidebooks out there. I think this is a lot of people's Bible, and we have a second Bible coming up. But uh, this gives you the, the guidelines for siting, for construction, for um, development and assessment. It talks about the appropriate reef materials that you can use, and it uh, references the guidelines for marine artificial reef materials, which you'll see in a moment, which these people put together. Sightings, you need to consider the objectives of your reef. Just a moment ago, y'all were talking about near shore versus offshore. That's gonna really depend on, that's gonna decide where you're gonna wanna put, obviously, you know, your reef. Um, recreation, are you looking at snorkelers or are you looking at deep scuba divers? Um, or fishing, uh, spear fishing. It just, it depends on what population you're trying to target, um, people-wise as well as species-wise. Um, Prevent uh, unreasonable obstructions to navigation. Again, for the core, our responsibility for the Rivers and Arbors Act is navigation. Um, minimum depth clearance is uh, half, I'm sorry, two times the height of the material at the top, and that is uh, measured from mean low water. Minimize user conflicts. Obviously, if you have somebody out there that's gonna, you know, they're, they built this reef for diving, and then you have the fishermen come up and start, you know, fishing their species that they were wanting to dive and, and look at. Um, so we want to get that information out there as well, and protect re existing resources. Obviously, if there's a coral reef existing out there, you don't want to throw, you know, a reef ball on top of it. A moment ago, I mentioned to you specific things that NOAA requires that they need for artificial reef. And uh, a lot of you have probably seen this. Uh, this is very um, uh, uh, familiar to a lot of you that look at charts, uh, but we need uh, accurate geographic coordinates. And we discourage the, the point radius reefs where you just give us the center and say, okay, we're gonna go around a circle and that's gonna be our area. Um, we like to get the coordinates at each corner as well as in the center. Um, this is something that Noah has been asking us for. Um, obviously, the minimum clearance, that's going to be on your charts for, for the nautical charts. Um, no conflict with, some, again, if somebody already has a reef there, you don't want to put one there. Um, and deployment notification. There are several requirements and permit conditions for the core. That's pre-deployment and post-deployment. So we're seeing what's being deployed, exactly where to go. Again, uh, another Bible um, for reef materials. Gives you a lot of examples, which we'll look at. Material criteria, we've got four things that we really look at. Function, um, compatibility, stability, and durability. Just as they were talking about a minute ago with the hurricane, you wanna make sure what you put down there stays down there. Um, I know there's the acts of God, but um, that's why we're looking at these types of materials that have been shown to meet these criteria. Again, uh, just kind of a rundown of um, the acceptable material requirements. Um, just know this is not an end all be all. Uh, sometimes, and I can't think of an exact example at the moment, but sometimes somebody wants to put something different than, than what is listed you know, in, in the reef guide, in the reef material guideline. And so uh, we can entertain other, other things, but when we do that, we need to put it into our public notice and put that out to the public to let them see what unusual quote unquote items would be put out there, it's something that we would normally do. 
as uh, we were looking at, um, acceptable materials, we have reef falls in the back. Um, great things. Uh, they tend to be uh, the most um, successful in a lot of the um, monitoring that we had seen. Large concrete building demolition materials. Earlier, we were talking about DuPont Bridge. The construction, when they um, blew that up, they have a, a reef that um, from those materials, as well as um, ferrous and aluminum alloy metal components. Hold best vessels. Now, um, obviously, as a uh, couple of people have talked about deploying some of these um, vessels, there's a lot of requirements, a lot of cleanup. Um, now, that's not to say these aren't great reef structures. So, uh, but they have to pass a lot of different inspections, you need to go through the Coast Guard. There's a lot of um, coordination that can be done with that. Uh, Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, they have the rigs to reef. We were talking about a moment ago, someone was talking about the towers that um, maybe possibly, you know, put them, blow them up, quote unquote, on site and, and let them and start them from there. Um, and then decommission oil and gas platforms, which um, I believe Alex, mention something about going over to Louisiana. Unacceptable materials. Um, I know a gentleman earlier showed us that early, early 1970 um, tire deployment. <laughs> As he said, it's, that's, not, uh, that's not necessarily acceptable today. Um, we've learned a lot, which is, which is great. So um, tires, um, this looks like to be some kind of remedial early um, artificial reef structure. Um, uh, these guys are having a good time. We just kind of blew up open fiberglass vessel just to put down there. Public oh, notice. I'm going to turn this over to Tracy and she's going to address public notice and uh, essential fish habitat. I'm oh, sorry, endangered species. Endangered species. I'm not doing essential fish habitat today. <laughs> I'm Tracy Wheeler. I work out of the Panama City field office. Um, I do a lot of work with endangered species stuff, so I get that, that joy. Um, we have a lot of responsibilities when we get a permit application from you. We have to fulfill a whole bunch of federal laws and we have to do a whole lot of coordinating. We're required by our regulations to do that. Um, we want to gather as much information from the public and from other agencies as we can so that we can be sure that the projects that we permit are in the best public interest. So for everybody's interest. Um, so that's what when we put out, a, we, we get all that information from you so that we have enough information to put it out to the public to gather information back. And sometimes we have conflict with users, groups and stuff that, you know, somebody may not want your structure or somebody may want a whole bunch of your structures. And we wanna gather as much information as we can. It is not a discourse, it is not a conversation. It is us asking to gather the information. If we have conflicts that come up, we'll go back to the applicant and we'll say, okay, these things were brought up. These are things that we were not aware of. I don't like my voice, that was weird. <laughs> but, um, you know, so we'll, if we have subjects that come up or questions that come up or new information, we will coordinate back with the applicant, but that's a conversation between the applicant and the core. We don't get into a lot of um, back and forth with, with commenters. Sometimes we do have public hearings or public meetings that are required as part of our permit process. And then that time we do have some more of those, those conversations, but mostly at this point, it's for gathering information. Um, we are required by law to coordinate with a whole bunch of agencies. We do this for every standard permit that we issue. Um, for artificial reefs, though, we do have um, requirements to coordinate with the Coast Guard, port authorities, military bases, and the non-government organizations like the Southern Shrimp Alliance because there are groups that they have more interest in activities that happen offshore. So we, we wouldn't necessarily coordinate a Walmart uh, standard permit with Coast Guard because they don't care, but they would care more about the artificial reefs that come up. Um, Section seven of the Endangered Species Act requires us, if we take a federal action, issuing a permit is a federal action, it's authorizing an activity in federal um, areas where your federal jurisdiction. It requires us to make an effect determination and coordinate that determination with the resource agency. Um, this is what tends to take us a fair amount of time when we're dealing with projects like artificial reefs because we have to make sure that we meet all the requirements for either a Fish and Wildlife Service or National Marine Fisheries Service. We don't do a whole lot for artificial, well, goodness gracious, artificial reefs. <laughs> um, 
with, uh, with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service because most of their species are more inshore. But if you're doing any equipment staging um, or transportation across shallow water areas, we may need to address manatees, um, high ground areas for equipment and um, material staging might impact uh, in Eastern Indigo Snake or something like that. But primarily we deal with the National Marine Fisheries Service. Um, so they have a lot of species that are out there. A lot of the things that you want to attract are things that they're responsible for. Um, but it does take a long time for us to do a biological assessment for them to issue a biological opinion. And then we get all of our, you know, all of our conditions and everything. Um, it takes a very thorough review. We want them to be responsible. We want to have that kind of review, but we also want to be efficient. So um, the Corps of Engineers and National Marine Fisheries Service got together uh, a little over a year ago. We adopted the Jacksonville biological opinion. It, um, it addresses um, consultation for in-water work for several different areas or different activities. Um, it utilizes uh, project design criteria. So if you can meet certain criteria, you, got, you, know, you get the checkbox and you can move forward with your project. It's an efficiency for us and for them. It helps us get our projects through faster while giving the appropriate level of review. So we, we are meeting our responsibilities, but we're doing it in a faster way. Um, and I got to speed up a lot. So there are 10 activities that are covered. Number seven is the aquatic habitat enhancement, um, and that covers our official reefs. Um, they, there are project design criteria for all projects that are in water. So if you have any project that is in the water, it has to meet specific criteria. Um, and there are 11 of those that apply. And then there are specific act, uh, PDCs for artificial reefs. And they start activity number seven, like I said, is the one that addresses artificial reefs. And um, condition 13 for activity seven is where the artificial reef requirements kick in. And there are a lot of them. I don't expect you to be able to read them. I just wanted to show that they're there. I think they're 24. 22, I'm sorry, 22 different conditions. Um, a lot of our standard permit conditions that we put on reef permits mirror the um, JAXPO conditions. So if you have had a permit before, or you can pull up a, a permit that has been issued previously and you can see the standard conditions, you probably will comply with JAXPO. Um, JAXPO does specify the kind of materials that um, are covered by the biological opinion and vessel deployment is not covered by the Jacksonville biological opinion. So that would that would take a formal consultation with National Marine Fisheries Service. Okay. Um, so there are a whole bunch of permit conditions. I, we can get those, like I said, they're standard. If you wanna reach out to Lisa or to me, we can provide those to you if you're designing a project. Um, and we're gonna put Lisa back up here. And that was like speedy and dangerous species. If you have any questions, find me and I'll answer them. <laughs> Run out of time. So real quickly, um, the enforcement compliance end of it, uh, that uh, comes in with the, uh, the Clean Water Act. There's a couple of um, sections. There's the 404S and then there's also the 309E, I believe. Um, but just to let you know that there are administrative penalties that can occur um, if, uh, if the permits are not um, in compliance. Um, Ensure deployments are in, within the boundaries. And then summary. I know you can't see that. Um, I'm going to have all of this up. Uh, Scott's already got it. So if he wants to um, give it to any of y'all, that gives us our, um, our field offices. Application submittal form along as uh, well with the application um, email. Again, this is going to be on our main uh, Jacksonville website and I can give y'all all that information. And those are references. So that's it. Thank you, Tracy and, and Lisa. Actually, if you can come on, come on back up. And, and I do appreciate you staying within the time because we especially wanted to make sure that we had time for questions. Usually permitting, we see a lot of questions for that. So, um, so we'll take any questions. I see Bob has his hand up. Oh, and so go ahead. Good morning, ladies. Morning. Uh, Bob Cox from Mexico Beach. The, uh, you know, having experience over the years with uh, applying for permits, uh, I was wondering if the JAXPO, if your application meets the requirements of the JAXPO, are they getting through agencies faster now, like uh, National Marine Fishery Services? Because I know typically for us, National Marine Fishery Services, where our process gets hung up for quite a while. Um, if you meet the terms and conditions of JAXPO, 
uh, we send in the information. We have to fill out some checklists and, and information to provide to them based on the information you provide us. But um, we send them an email and we can issue the permit that day. Uh, we don't have to get anything back from them. They will, if, if for some reason one of us makes a mistake um, and submit something that doesn't meet JAXPO, they will let us know that and then we'll let you know. Um, but if it, it complies with JAXPO, then you can, we can issue the permit the day that um, we make that determination. Okay, thank So that you. speeds things way up. Yes. Expectation setting. So when the NERDA phase three came in, right, there was a deluge, you were inundated with a whole bunch of reefing, things like that. Um, with a, within three miles of the Florida coastline, from flash to bang in a quarter mile by quarter mile, you know, standard permitting, what do you, what would you expect to tell us as reef coordinators and managers is the expected timeline from submitting a permit to actually getting a validated permit with no errors on it going into your office? I would say uh, 120 days, as I said earlier, for the standard permits. We currently don't don't have any programmatic permits or nationwides that address artificial reefs. So it would definitely move it into the standard permit. And um, with that, as we were talking about earlier, you have a public notice time period. So that's a 30 day at least time period that's, you know, we're, we're waiting for comments. Uh, as she stated, uh, with the JAXPO, you know, there's there's not a waiting time for that. There used to be a 10-day waiting time with a, a different programmatic that we had. And then, of course, with informal and formal, there's an open-ended consultation. So um, I would I would say 120 days. Okay, that's significantly better than the 18 to 24 months that it has been taken. Yes, it is. Yes, yes. okay. Perfect. I just want to the, make sure that was out here for Yep. That's why we love JAXPO. That's why <laughs> yeah, and I guess we are I, cheering for JAXPO. I guess I'd like to add to that, Bob, that, you know, please use our office, FWC, Artificial Reef Program in Tallahassee, to, to help provide the technical assistance for the statute. You know, that's one of the reasons why we're here, uh, you know, and um, we have, we've increased our equipment over the past three or four years or so. So we now have the in-house capability to assist with some of those surveys, you know, in, specifically side scan sonar i think is <laughs> will help with a lot of the mapping and that'll help accelerate the process so you know the work the permits that bill horn is reauthorizing off of uh Wakulik, franklin counties and grayson shepherd you know um some of those i think you're utilizing some of our side scan we've got okaloosa county you know in queue to help side scan those three sites that that alex is uh you know identified so please use us and we can help um as as best we can make sure the applications are complete before they're submitted to the core. And just know side scan takes time and we have, we're working with multiple counties. So don't come to us in the final hour, you know, saying we need this survey. Cause unfortunately, you know, other people might have to take priority over that. All right, one last question. All right, thanks. Uh, with the JAXPO, uh, how does the, just, I'm just curious how the cultural assessments, you know, come in, uh, cultural resource assessments come in. So essentially you have your public notice period and then you have, you know, your historic preservation association that requires that. But if it, if it fulfills the JAXPO, does that, do, do you still have to do all of those cultural resource assessments? That's the question. So JAXPO and the cultural resource assessments are something totally different. Um, the JAXPO addresses the endangered species whereas the um, cultural resources addresses the National Historic Preservation Act. So there, there are two separate laws that we're, that we're looking at. So um, in certain cases, I know one you know, in particular with the Bay County SAR sites, um, in, in, uh, as a result of our public notice, SHPO asked for cultural resources or surveys for these sites. We don't get that request every time. So it's not a, every time you have to do it, it's in this case, they felt that, you know, it, it needed it. Have those cultural resource assessments in Florida ever turned up anything that, that caused the site to be cited differently? I can tell you in my experience personally, no, but I don't cover the whole state of Florida and I can imagine that there are some boat wrecks and things that are outside. Yeah, that, well, and even here, there there have been a few. Probably most recently, Volusia County, where they identified some targets, and you know, rather than uh, implementing a full archaeological assessment, they opted to, you know, create an avoidance well, area uh, around that, and that allowed the process to, to proceed. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>
Next, I'd like to invite uh, Victor Blanco up, um, changing gears a, a little bit. We had the pleasure of um, <clears throat> uh, a, a grant agreement with, uh, with Victor and, uh, um, and Taylor County um, over the past year to try to re, uh, reinvigorate their volunteer dive team. And uh, I, we thought that it would be appropriate for Victor to, to share some of uh, his experience working with these, these volunteers in, uh, in creating this, this new dive team for Taylor County. So please welcome uh, Victor. All right, which one is Victor's? Thank you, Kate. Tanner. Well, actually, uh, I'm not in the northwest, northwest, but we're kind of you know, of a fussy area where uh, the artificial reef uh, program has been working for a, a long time. I've been in the position as a sea grant agent only for a couple of, of years in, in Taylor County. And I realized that uh, artificial reefs and scalloping were like the two main uh, or the most important programs wrong in the coast of, of the county. So I, I committed um, a little bit with this uh, program and with the guidance of, of Keith's office and his staff, uh, we, we were able to put together a proposal for a monitoring program during 2018. Um, so, uh, as I said, since 19, uh, about 1995, the Taylor County a group of, of people came together and created the Taylor County uh, Reef Research Team. Uh, at that time, the idea of the, of the research team was to do the surveys for the deployments, as well as uh, establish a monitoring program. Uh, actually, um, I think the, the person down back there, um, I'm sorry, I forgot your, your, your name, trained part of that team uh, back in that age, in that time. But um, so they did some surveys, but the information got a little bit lost, on, on, you know, dusty files uh, in the office. And uh, we thought it was very important to uh, evaluate the state, uh, like, like uh, uh, have a snapshot of the artificial reef that have been deployed for such a long time, for more than two decades, and, and see the real impact of the artificial reef in, in the county. Uh, so with the funds from FDBC, we were able to uh, establish that. Um, the first, first step we took was to try to build up a new group of divers. And we used the social media to do that. Uh, this is uh, the um, post that we uh, put on Facebook and we got a wonderful response. We had more than 31,000 people reach, uh, more than 200 uh, shares more than 100 comments. And at the end of this uh, phase, we got at least 86 persons uh, who wanted to, to be part of the monitoring program. Uh, even people from Atlanta sign up to go, to go down and say, well, this is Taylor County in, in the Gulf of Mexico. And say, yeah, I'm willing to go down there and support the program. Um, then the second step was to, uh, of course, we needed to train the group. Uh, we invite everybody to, to sign up for a training session. The training was uh, separating in two, uh, in two phases. The first phase was an online module where we sent uh, information about fish identification. Uh, we worked together with Bill Lindbergh to build a list of the most common uh, fish found in artificial reef in the Gulf of Mexico in, 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 in our area. Uh, and then after a couple of weeks, we met in the Instinct Hatch Community Center and we held uh, an in-person training where with our specialist, um, uh, she uh, delivered the presentation or the training on the uh, stationary method and the robbing uh, method to do fish counts. And we also went through uh, um, all the, the forms that we were going to use uh, during our surveys. 
and uh, at the end of the uh, of this uh, of the session, they have to take a test. And uh, as part of the agreement with FDBC, those who uh, got 90% or more into the test were able to be part as uh, surveyors for the fish count during the monitoring uh, dives. So th this was a very, very important part. At the end, we got 30 persons uh, during the training and actually, a, a 28 of those 30 persons uh, were involved in the dives. Uh, it was a very challenging thing to coordinate all the dive and to <laughs> be able to make everybody go in the water, but we, we managed that. Uh, so here is part of the presentations uh, from, from Angela Collins. Uh, and she, during the training, she presented uh, some case studies which was a, a really good way for uh, the persons to uh, understand a little bit what we were doing. I would say that uh, at least 30% were um, students, uh, graduate or uh, students. Uh, and then uh, the rest was just regular divers who wanted to, to jump in and help build this uh, monitoring program. Uh, at the end, what we did is uh, we selected 18 sites. Uh, these 18 sites uh, included uh, four different types of materials, limber cubes, tetrahedrons, uh, concrete culvers, and uh, scrap metal. Uh, and they were deployed in different uh, periods from uh, 1996 up to uh, 2015. Uh, so uh, it, it also allowed us to, to see how they were doing in time, uh, the structures and uh, how well they were doing attracting fish. Uh, at the end, volunteer divers uh, uh, involved more than 700 hours of volunteer uh, time uh, with an estimate uh, that's uh, an equivalent of more than $16,000 in um in contributions and uh, at least, and that they travel from, from different distance. I, I would say 80% of the divers were from Gainesville or Tallahassee. So they, they have to, to travel a couple of hours at least to uh, go on forward uh, to, to go to this, um, to this monitoring program. Uh, to your right, you will see the Bokai Reef monitoring uh, site and and the circle, the purple circle, uh, represent the 18 sites that we selected. Uh, actually, we see in the south, so both those deployment of the titraniums are right outside of the permit area. And uh, those are the titraniums. And um, uh, so we wanted to include that in the monitoring program as well. This is part of the, of the uh, forms that we used to collect the data. It was just a list. Of, uh, of all the most common fish found in the artificial reefs. Uh, and then uh, space to, to get information for the stationary, which would just count the exact number of fish that you see in a specific area. Or during the robbing, it's just, it was just uh, a fish abundance, like a single, few, many, or abundance. Um, one aspect that we didn't cover uh, in this uh, monitoring program was the, the size of the fish. It was kind of difficult and we'll go through that um, later. And then we had the other uh, form to collect the data, uh, have a draft of the, uh, of the reef down there, uh, see what's the coverage, if the, uh, if the artificial reef material was intact or was crumbled, uh, what was the status of the material underwater. Uh, here, part of the of the team uh, before the dives, and then at the end uh, we had a, a we have two teams each each session. We had two teams. One was made of uh, scientific divers, and the other one was the volunteer divers. And th this was due to uh, university regulations, where uh, as it was a, a university involved we could not go with volunteers, divers in the same boat for the ability reasons. 
Um, so in both groups, uh, we make sure one diver was collecting the fish sensing data, the other, other diver was collecting the artificial reef structure assessment, and then we had a third diver uh, taking pictures and video of the whole sessions. So we built this uh, uh, YouTube channel, which is Boca Reef. We have 32 uh, videos loaded there where you can see all the materials uh, um, and um, some uh, is, is gonna be a very useful tool for retraining or uh, this year or volunteers and train the new volunteers who's going, who, who we expect are gonna join our, our artificial reef uh, program. A monitoring program. Uh, we have more than a thousand views in the 36, in the 32 uh, uh, videos. And of course, this material open to uh, anybody to use to uh, maybe train uh, your groups. Uh, <clears throat> some uh, results here's the list of all the fish and the cumulative abundance with all the, uh, in all the reef sites. And uh, well, we took out, of course, the Tom Tates and, and, and f fish bait uh, because of the, the amount was too high. So uh, we, we just took those out, out of the graph. Uh, but we see that a slippery dig and um, a sand perch are like the most common, but uh, it, it was a large uh, abundance uh, as well of uh, great, uh, great snappers uh cubu uh fish was very abundant uh, everywhere but i think this this shows a, a very more important uh results uh reef one to four is limber cubes reef five and six is scrap metal uh <clears throat> reef nine to twelve is the tea tray drums and then the rest is a scrap metal so we see uh that scrap metal is really doing very good attracting fish. Uh, we also saw that uh, the scrap metal usually uh, covers a larger uh, areas uh, on the on the sea bottom, but they're doing pretty good. All the material we found was intact, at least 90, 95 percent intact on on the bottom, which is great. And um, we really look forward to improve our uh, program. So what we did is we, we came back to our uh, team and we asked them uh, for some feedback. And uh, so we have a couple of, of uh, responses here. They said the first one is uh, overall, how satisfied or dissatisfied are you with your experience with artificial reef monitoring training program? First we asked about the training. So pretty much every, everybody was satisfied or very satisfied, just a couple of persons were not satisfied or very strict. Um, then we asked them about uh, how likely you were there to attend a new training session for the monitoring. Of course, everybody would like to, uh, to be part, most of the people wanted to be uh, involved again. This is a lot of information, but uh, we asked them, what would you recommend to improve the, the monitoring training session? Uh, some people said that it, it, it was awesome, but uh, it's very small here. So uh, more pictures, more online, more videos. Uh, initially, we had, uh, as part of the agenda for the training, uh, after the class, go in the pool and do some practice in the pool. At, at the end, we had to, uh, to keep that out of the, of the agenda. Uh, for the two reasons that, uh, from the person who was going to uh, let us use the, the pool. But they said that this is something very important because sometimes they were not uh, too, it, it, it was very di different from what they saw on the training of what happened really during the dives. So, and then we asked them, okay, uh, what can we improve? What can we improve during our dive sessions? And uh, pretty much everybody was very happy. Um, <clears throat> some people said that uh, we needed to be more accurate finding the reefs. At the beginning, we just found the reef and point out the, uh, the boats uh, through the anchor, but uh, the currents usually make the boat drift. So when the divers went in the water, it was, they had diff difficult time finding the reefs. This happened several times. So uh, we changed that and we just came into the spot. We, uh, we deploy a buoy 
uh, and then the divers were uh, able to die, uh, to swim directly to to the reef side. Um, communication, which I don't understand, because ev before every uh, every dive session, I have a debriefing for thirty minutes where I, I went through the whole uh, activity again with each role, what the role, what each diver had to do in their role. We went through the form. We went through the materials and the sites that we were going to uh, to to dive. They have uh, binders with uh, laminated pictures of the sites and uh, potential material that we were going to find underwater. Uh, so I tried to provide a lot of the information. So, but but at, at the end, communication can be improved somehow. Uh, more air at the beginning. We just had a. Uh, uh, one tank, but uh, at the end we used to bring two or three tanks for a couple of dives. It, this was only like 50 feet deep, uh, and we used to uh, uh, schedule our dive for a 30 minutes dive to cover all the activities. Um, I think it, it, it was a very good and very challenging um, program. We, we learn a lot and uh, people is very motivated to continue participating this year in the group. Uh, as long as, as uh, we get some funding um, with, the, with the volunteers, also some volunteers broke their boats and we pay for the gas and we pay for the air. They were very happy to, to uh, jump in and go in the water and collect the data uh, is it, still, I'm still working on the final uh, report, uh, but I, I, we're very happy with the results. And uh, I think it's a great way to uh, address a monitoring program for all these, all, all the counties that are, are working on artificial reefs. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Victor. Uh, if we have any questions, we have plenty of time. Oh, Bob, uh, that was a quick hand up there. Christine's running the mic over to you so we can capture that on the Facebook. Good job there, Victor. I like what you're doing there and the good turnout you had with uh, 30 plus divers. Um, as far as boat support, uh, were all your uh, volunteers uh, there with pr private boats or was there any chartered boats involved? Uh, as I mentioned, we had two teams uh, for the scientific diver team. We had a charter boat, uh, was uh, a crabber. So we had plenty of room. It was very, very easy to go in and out the water. Uh, in that boat, it, we, it, we could hold more than four divers that usually were in that boat. And the volunteers uh, boat was a volunteer boat. So some, one, one of, the, of the divers, come with his own boat and, and we paid for the gas and, and the air of the divers. Okay, great, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, did you compare the data from the scientific divers to the volunteer divers? Uh, we haven't gone deep into comparisons uh, between those two, but uh, as part of my quality control, quality assurance, uh, after I, I came back from the dive and went to the, to the office, I tried to went through each form and make sure to make calls and check with the videos. Uh, um, I can say without a doubt, okay, <laughs> maybe, that uh, scientific divers used to uh, identify more species per site than uh, the, the volunteer divers. Um, I, I think this is this is something that is happening, and that's why we need to work more on fish ID, uh, especially you know the not trophy fish that they are not familiar with. Uh, it's very common to misidentify the uh, slipper dig with uh, sand perch. For a, a, a trained person, it's very obvious, but for a not training person, if you are sitting on the bottom. And they're swimming around together. It's very easy to uh, uh, to think it's only one species when you have a two species. And this happens also with juvenile species. For example, the white grunt, uh, they get confused to identify the white grunt juveniles as well. 
right. <clears throat> We're not going to keep you from lunch, but we do. Um, we would like a group photo. So I think before lunch, if everyone can just go outside by the steps, we're gonna take a group photo. And then I promise you guys can eat. Um, a couple housekeeping things. If you have an afternoon presentation, if you guys could come up to the podium around 1250 so I can get those presentations from you, that'd be great. And also a reminder, those orange sheets uh, for the evaluations, um, they're broken out into sessions. So you guys can go ahead and fill out those morning sessions um, but we, we do want those to be completed by the end of the day. So yes, 